Three, episode one of Scandal picks up exactly where season two left off, as if no time had passed in between the two. Olivia Pope, fixer of problems, problem solver, handler of things, fabulous winter coat wearing Olivia Pope has just been outed as the mistress of the president of the United States, who is in fact this little sponge-like creature over here who looks like he needs a catheter. She has been outed as his mistress. Rowan, this man, the biggest big bad of all the big bads, runner of the top secret spy organization that is more or less a group of hit men hired by the United States, even though the United States doesn't know that they hired them. He has just been outed as Olivia Pope's father. He is trying to convince her to leave the country because she was banging the president and the whole world found out. So leaving the country and getting a new identity is the only possible solution. Now, considering that he technically works for the government, even if the government doesn't know that he works for them, using those connections to buy your daughter a new identity is probably a crime that's worthy of a pretty little string, right? By pretty little string, I mean these. These strings, for those of you that are new, are crimes. I have categorized all the crimes by color because we are doing a crime by crime recap of this show. We are not going by seasons. We are not going by episodes. We are in fact going by felonies. Felonies and misdemeanors. I would go through all of the colors of the strings for you, but I kind of forget them. So, so we're just gonna roll with it. I think they're written into the script. You'll figure it out or you could go watch part one and then you'll know. Cyrus Bean. Cyrus Bean is our resident ethical egoist. He is, because we are doing that as well, we are occasionally taking breaks to talk about ethics if and when I remember to do so. He is our resident ethical egoist, so if it's good for Cyrus, it's the morally right thing to do, more or less. He is a gay Republican with the temper of the Tasmanian devil and a tendency towards homicidal behavior. He calls Olivia Pope up and he's like, hey, we have a problem, I need you to fix it. So she does not, in fact, take Papa Pope up on his deal to go get her a new life. So he gets to live string free on my board for another day. The election fraud crisis of last season is over and dealt with. We have moved on. Our new crisis is the fact that the whole world now knows that Olivia Pope was screwing the president of the United States, the married president of the United States to be specific. So that's that's the new crisis that we need to figure out how to deal with because Olivia Pope, you guys, she has never seen a day of chill in her entire life. Olivia Pope's body temperature is 103 degrees at base level and her anxiety lives at a constant six on a scale of one to five. She handles it. However, relaxed, is not a word that we will use to describe Olivia Pope, okay? People people don't like regularly tell you that they will jump over a cliff for you if you're like calm, you know? Everyone is panicking. And by everyone, I mean everybody at OPA, which is Olivia Pope and Associates. That's these folks. These folks all work for her. We have Huck. He is attack dog, ex-military. He used to work for the spy organization and then it, it broke his brain. So he does not do that anymore. Quinn, I feel bad about using this picture of Quinn. Quinn was framed for a bombing, so Olivia hired her. Charlie also used to work for this. He's not really OPA, but he kind of is. And Harrison. We also have Harrison. Harrison gets a picture that... It, <laughs> I don't know why they did this, but when I was printing out all these pictures, I found that they did like a photo shoot for season three of all the cast just in the rain, like singing in the rain with like umbrellas. <laughs> and I don't know why, but I had to use at least one of them. So I picked Harrison, so that's Harrison in the rain. They are all freaking the freak out. They have like 7 billion new clients because they are a firm, they do fix other people's problems. And there are 55 million cameras outside because of the whole Olivia slept with the president of the United States thing. Also, Jake is missing. Jake, this is Jake. Jake is like, I did think I described him as like a mouse that wasn't supposed to survive a science experiment last time. And they just like felt bad and couldn't kill it when it lived. It's like a mutant mouse thing running around. But, he can also be described as like the living embodiment of when you make ramen, but you don't cook it all the way. He's missing because in case you forgot, Olivia's dad tried to have him killed because he wouldn't kidnap Olivia for him. Then when he was not killed, Rowan kidnapped him and put him in a hole in the ground. Hole, okay. 
We're not giving him a string because it happened last season. So, you know. Their first task is they need to find out who exactly leaked Olivia's name to the press. Who told, because everyone knew he had an affair with somebody because he just keeps having affairs. Who told the world that it was Olivia? His gorgeous wife, Melly, over here is like suspect number one, except they can rule her out because Olivia's name was Melly's sort of last weapon in her arsenal because Melly is a political mastermind. She is ruthless and she's not that stupid. She's not gonna waste her trump card for nothing. Cyrus didn't do it because this is Cyrus's literal worst nightmare. So they tracked down the journalist who reported it and they, the journalist heard it from a secret service member at a bar. This is Tom. This is Tom. Tom is a Secret Service member. Tom is one half of Tom and Hal. It might have been Hal, but I only have a picture of Tom. So Tom, he's a Secret Service agent that we have seen kind of lurking around in the background the last couple seasons, and he gets to be like a full-on character now. And he leaked this name, and that doesn't really make any sense. Also, why would I give him an entire picture? Who knows? Cyrus starts doing damage control and like just in case, orders the White House communications officer named Janine Locke to dig up some dirt on Olivia, his friend. Just in case. Janine Locke. Janine Locke, my friends, played by the one and only Beverly Keen. Bev Keen, ma'am. Thank you. So happy to have her back in my life. So happy to have her on this board. There we go. So she's Janine Locke. So Janine Locke is like communications officer. Cyrus tasks her with digging up dirt. I don't think that's a crime. I don't think that being nosy is a crime. At least I hope not. So we're not giving him a crime for that just yet. As for Olivia, Olivia is using one of her many secret cell phones that Fitz gave her and basically summons both Fitz and Melly to the bunker. Meet the bunker. The bunker is a, is a whole character. The bunker is one of our new locations. Every season you kind of get like a new place that we get to go, I guess, like to give like the people who make the sets something to do. So the bunker is our, 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 our big season three location and we are there all the time. <laughs> They have this like wonderful argument about exactly how many times Olivia thinks it is appropriate for Melly to believe that they slept together. <laughs> Cause Olivia's like, I'm gonna fix this. Um, how many times do you, would, it, would you be okay with the world knowing that we were together? Trying to make Melly feel comfortable. Melly, meanwhile, cannot refrain from calling Olivia a whore to her face to her face. Despite the fact that like, this has been known between the three of them for a while, but she gets to let it loose. And I do wanna talk about Melly's use of the word whore for a minute because it is unparalleled. It is like nothing else that I have ever experienced. Whore is derived from the Indo-European root of ka, meaning to desire, which in other languages went on to produce words like lover and friend, but the word as we know it came through old high Germanic languages from words like hora, meaning prostitute, horinyan, to commit adultery. It probably got influenced by Old English, whore, meaning physical filth or slime, and then Shakespeare got a hold of it, and the rest is history. Now, I tell you all of that because when Melly Grant starts calling Olivia Pope a whore. You hear that W capital letter. This is not Mean Girls. She is throwing that out there with her gut. I wouldn't need to smile at Oprah if you didn't screw your whore every chance you got. No. This is 17th century France profession in the royal court whore. She is, she is not fucking around. I don't, I don't know how Bellamy Young does it, but like it's, she, she is yelling this word at her. Like this is Olivia's side hobby. Like it's an occupation. Like she is disappointed in her for her career choice of woman sleeping with my husband. It simultaneously allows Olivia to exist separately from the man that she is boning, right? Because she's like, Olivia, you are relevant to this conversation. You just so happen to be standing in a place that is the woman who my husband sleeps with who is not me. It's really wild. It's really crazy. Just brilliant, brilliant performance. We love her. We love Melly. Melly can do no wrong. Well, no, Melly can do a lot of wrong, but we support Melly's wrongs. Anyway, Olivia's like, can you, can you refrain from calling me a whore in my presence? <laughs> and she agrees. So Melly, anyway, goes to OPA and Melly has OPA dig up some dirt on Janine and they find a video of her saying that the president is hot. So she brings that video 
to Cyrus Bean, who was like sick, perfect. Janine Locke is the one who. That's my cat. Janine Locke is the one who slept with the president. This is great. Let's blame Janine, and then no one will think that it's Olivia. So that's their plan. Olivia is uh, pissed. Fitz is pissed. Olivia's pissed because she has morals, and Fitz is pissed because he is the one who leaked Olivia's name in the first place. <laughs> I know. He apparently was like, I didn't want Melly to have this weapon anymore. He's also just dumb. <laughs> so that's the social drama that's going on. Our first crime, however, occurs when Rowan hires Charlie to kidnap and drug James. James is Cyrus's husband. If I remember correctly, we are doing purple for people who are hiring people to do other things. So that's that. Is kidnapping and drugging, is that orange or red? No, red is, red is the murdering, correct? Yes. Orange for the kidnapping. Right, so while James's husband is drugged and in bed, Charlie then also kidnaps Cyrus. We kidnap Cyrus and he starts talking to Cyrus about something called Operation Remington. Put a, put a big old bowling pin in that because we are gonna come back to that. Scandal loves a flashback. If there is one thing that Scandal loves, it's a flashback. So the second episode of the season is basically all flashbacks in which we get the I am your father backstory. Remember we got Huck's backstory and Huck's backstory was that he was like living in one of the subway stations and Olivia used to go to dinner every week with her father and she would bring him a doggy bag of food from the restaurant at the same time every week. This is the father. So this is the father. So Olivia was having dinner with her father every week we find out in exchange for him paying for her student loan relatable, right? But they're not like pals, okay? They're not friends. They have a little, like a little bit of tension. And so one day she's coming back from dinner and she gets mugged and Huck beats the living shit out of those guys. <laughs> like I have to give him an orange string for it because it was like a, a punch would, a punch would do, you know, it was, it was too much. So <laughs> orange string behavior. And she's like, that, that does not seem like normal homeless man behavior. That's, that seems fishy. So she starts digging into that. And this is how she finds out about B613. B613 is the secret spy organization. B613 is run by her father. She digs up a shell company that they use as a cover-up that is called Acme Limited that sells paper. And she's like, oh shit, B613, damn. And then she pulls out a pen that her father gave her earlier during dinner. We love Chekhov's pen. Chekhov's pen. Chekhov's pen. But she pulls out this pen that her father gave her and she sees on the pen, Acme Limited. Shonda does not fuck around when it comes to Chekhovian objects. My friends, if something is on screen for a millisecond longer than you think is absolutely necessary, it's gonna be important, it's gonna come back. So Olivia's like, uh, what the fuck? Why do you have this evil spy pen? And her dad is like, I don't have an evil spy pen, shut up. But he raised her. I mean, he sent her to private school, so he knows she's too smart for that. So he has to have Huck kidnapped and he's getting a purple string for it because he had somebody else do it, but we don't, I don't know who that was. Now, remember in season two, there was Senator Edison Davis, who doesn't have a picture, he doesn't matter. He comes back, but not for a couple seasons. Edison was Olivia's like fiance partner at the time. He just so happened to be on like a CIA spy committee, something along those lines. So she hits him up and is like, what's the vibe? And finds out that uh, womp womp, Rowan had him hit by a car. So Abby and OPA hack into Janine Locke's phone. So they can prove that Janine Locke was not with the president of the United States when they are saying that they were together. Also, Quinn, who is our resident newly newly minted hacker girl hacks into Olivia's email because she smells something fishy in the state of Denmark so she hacks into Olivia's email and she finds out that via mathematics and deduction Olivia is the one who got Huck off the hook of B613 because her dad is command 
command and you can't take command. Uh, unless you are his kid, then you can ask for very special favors from command and he may grant them for you, like saving your homeless friend from the subway. It's a good thing, doesn't get a string. Huck finds out about this and assaults Olivia in the parking lot. <laughs> Meanwhile, they have a client to deal with, this woman named Mary Nesbitt. So Mary Nesbitt is a woman who goes into the like Capitol building with a bomb because <laughs> her son was like deemed a terrorist. He was killed by the government for that. And she is like, absolutely not. That's not true. I don't believe that. And it just so happens that, that um, Olivia Pope is there. <laughs> so there is like a lot of hacking being done at OPA because of this. Lots of file hacking and such. Blue strings, blue strings. David, David Rosen, the law himself. I am the law. The law is me. He actually, he blackmails Cyrus. He blackmails Cyrus Bean into giving him the unredacted file on Mary Nesbitt's son, which is some yellow string behavior, okay? And it turns out, it turns out that Mary Nesbitt's son was not a terrorist. He was in deep, deep, cover. He was way undercover with the terrorist cell and the FBI agents or whoever like discovered them did not know that. And he was killed because they did not know where his true loyalties lied. But they can't tell Mary that. They can't tell Mary that because it would put all of the other undercover agents that he recruited at risk. She is so heartbroken by this that she waits till pretty much everybody is evacuated and then uh, she detonates the bomb inside the Capitol building. Rest in peace, Mary Nesbitt. In the meantime, Huck is stalking Rowan. He's stalking Rowan and his stalking leads him to a trailer. And in that trailer, Rowan uses his Jedi mind powers to convince Huck to shoot the guy in the trailer. So Huck does that. Now, I think in the last video, when somebody ordered somebody else to kill somebody else, I used a black string, but I don't have any more black string. So we're gonna use white string because that feels different than just like your standard kidnap this guy and torture him for information, you know? The reason that he had Huck shoot that guy is because of Operation Remington, which we still don't know what that is, but we do know that it's, it's worth killing over, so. Next client is Senator Myers. Senator Myers is accused of brutally murdering a woman because they found really gross text messages between the two of them on her phone. They're very scandalous and he's accused of murder. His wife, who I'm not giving her her own thing, his wife lies on the stand for him because she full, really, really believes that he did not do this. She does not think for a second that he killed that woman, even though she sees the like horrible texts on their phone. The reason of course that she does not think that he did it is because she did it. <laughs> Get your cases, my friends. Next client that OPA helps is uh, Josie Marcus. And I thought I printed out a picture of her, but I guess I did not. It's Phoebe from Friends. Josie Marcus is running for president. And the only problem is that she had a baby when she was a teenager and she gave it up for adoption. So basically the team go out to like Minnesota or wherever she's from and they pay off anybody who might've known about it. This is not actually a crime because the money is not covering up a crime. It's just to be nice. <laughs> Huck in the meantime has teamed up with Jake, which is always a bad idea. I guess Jake's out of the hole, by the way. They've teamed up to take command, but you can't take command, son. You can't take command, son. No. They basically break into Rowan's house and steal a bunch of shit from his computer. Among the shit that they stole from his computer is the file on Operation Remington. We've mentioned Operation Remington twice already and it's more complicated than it needs to be. But all you need to know for now is that according to military record, Fitzgerald Grant III was flying cover on a rescue mission in Iran when he was in the Navy 
as part of Operation Remington. That's all that we know. All of these files that they find on Operation Remington were redacted and signed off by Fitzgerald Grant II, Fitz's father, Jerry, sus, to say the least. So it says Fitz number two, if you can't read it, because this one's number three, so it's confusing. Welcome to the club. So they keep on digging into these files and it turns out that Fitzgerald Grant III was not in fact flying cover on a mission in Iran. He was flying a top secret mission in Iceland where he shot down a passenger plane and killed 329 people. Obviously that's a pretty long string because among these passengers on this plane was a woman named Maya Lewis. This is Maya Lewis. Maya Lewis, a woman who never took her husband's name and is in fact Maya Pope. Yeah, so Fitz killed Olivia's mom. <laughs> Earth shaking mic drop. You know what I mean? Just exploding. And this is such good news for Jake because Jake hates Fitz because Olivia loves Fitz more than she loves Jake because Jake's stupid. But Jake is stoked because now he can be like, ha ha, you can't love a man who killed your mother. I didn't kill your mom. Which to be fair, like not having killed her mother is, is probably a bonus. So he is probably right to be stoked. But again, Olivia loves Fitz more than she loves Jake because Jake is stupid. So she's like, I need proof. I need legitimate proof. I'm not just gonna believe you because you're stupid. I hate Jake. Also, she wants proof because she thinks that it was Rowan who ordered him to shoot down the plane, which he did. He does tend to kill people who ask too many questions, so. So Jake is trying to get the cockpit recording of that flight so he can find out like exactly what went down. And he's gonna do this by going to like an old spy connection friend, because remember he worked for the B613 as well. So he goes to an old spy person, but whoopsies, Rowan has already hired said spy person to kill Jake when they get there. This says spy, it's really small. Now that would be a white string, red string situation. Only uh, the president has already hired someone else to shoot the woman before she can shoot Jake. And so technically it's just a purple string situation there and a white string and little tiny red string for the, for the spy. So, so she's gone. Bye bye spy lady. Meanwhile, Cyrus is threatening Harrison with getting this Adnan Saif character who we've never heard of before, but whose name is said with such intensity that we know that they are very important. Cyrus is threatening Harrison that he's gonna get Adnan Saif a new visa. Unless, of course, Harrison convinces Olivia to drop Josie as a presidential candidate client. So that's like definitely blackmail, for sure. Which I think is yellow. Meanwhile, Quinn has been going to the gun shooting range to do gun shooting, and she keeps casually running into Mr. Charlie over here, and Charlie is happy to help her learn how to shoot a gun, whereas Huck will not. So, Olivia gets Fitz to admit, or rather just not deny, that he was flying the plane in Operation Remington that killed her mother. So that's a bummer for them too. How do they come back from that? God only knows. Also, it's important to note at this point, Fitz has no idea that Rowan is Olivia's father. He knows Rowan, they have a relationship. They have a relationship. She knows that they have a relationship. He has no idea that that's her father. So, layers. OPA's new task is to investigate the plane crash and they need to figure out what what went down. And they basically find out that before takeoff, there was a man named Omar Dresden. Omar Dresden was taken off the plane right before takeoff. And yet his family was told that he died in the crash and still thinks that he died in the crash, which is sus. We also find out that the investigator of the crash, like from a not B613 stance, like the military guy who looked into it, Fitzgerald Grant II. Fitzgerald Grant II covered up the fact that Fitz shot down a plane. 
speaking of Fitzgerald Grant II, this Fitzgerald Grant II is named Jerry. Um, same as Fitz's kid, but he's named Jer Jerry. I guess, I guess he's also Fitzgerald. Yeah, no, I guess. Why spell it with a J? Anyway, he sucks. Like, he's a big old bummer. He's really mean. He's super mean to Fitz. He makes Fitz feel very sad all the time. Daddy issues galore. And he tells Melly that Fitz shot down the plane because there was, like, intelligence that there was a bomb on it. That's, like, the, the general story, is that there was a bomb on the plane, so that's why they had to shoot it down over the water so that it didn't, like, explode over London or something. Jerry actually, content warning, for anyone. Um, back when they were, when he was running for like governor and all of this Revington stuff was like getting covered up because he was running for governor or something and they were still trying to have kids, Fitzgerald Grant II raped Melly. And it's so sad. And she, the next day, uses it as a way to force him to tell Fitz that he's proud of him. Like, she's not going to tell anyone what happened, but he needs to tell Fitz that he's proud of him. And he does, and that really helps Fitz, like, with confidence or whatever. Because Melly, <laughs> because Melly is, Melly is a force of nature. Melly is something else. So it's also implied that this incident may or may not have resulted in their first child, Fitzgerald Grant, I'm guessing the fourth. Meanwhile... Meanwhile, Leo Bergen, this is Leo Bergen. Leo Bergen is the second best fixer in town because he's no Olivia Pope. He is helping Sally Langston run for president. This is the only picture that I could find of Leo that was like visible enough to print and it's him holding hands and praying with Sally Langston. So, so they, they're sharing a photo because she's running for president while she is still vice president. I don't know if that was made clear because I guess you can do that. But that's obviously not great for anyone else on the board. So Melly and Cyrus hire a call girl to seduce Sally's husband, which like, I can't name the crime, but it certainly feels like a blue string crime. It feels like a crime occurred. So it doesn't work because, ooh, doesn't work because uh, he's probably gay. Conveniently, Cyrus's husband is also gay. So Cyrus Bean decides to manipulate his husband into hitting on Daniel in hopes that Daniel will hit on James because he doesn't think that James will go through with it, but James kind of figures out what's going on. Ah! But he figures it out, so he does take the bait and he does sleep with Sally's husband just to be like, what did you expect me to do? <laughs> and somebody took pictures of that. So somebody took pictures. Pictures were taken non-consensually. I don't know why I picked a pink string. It says to use a pink string, so. Meanwhile, Quinn is stalking Charlie, which is some yellow string behavior, while he is stalking someone else. Doesn't really matter who this person is, but stalking someone else. So she's stalking him while he's stalking someone else. And he manipulates her into knocking this security guard out with a syringe. Only, Rutro, she didn't knock him out, she killed him. Whoops. Quinn is now the property of B613. At the same time, OPA are trying to find evidence that Omar Dresden was taken off the plane and they track down a singular witness. That singular witness is working as a security guard and oh well, let's just say that that's a dead end. Basically Rowan knew that they would find out what was going on with this situation so he neutralized the security guard in advance and also was like this will be really convenient to have one of Olivia's like people under my order. Rowan, unlike the president of the United States, is very good at his job. While it might look on paper like Omar Dresden was taken off of that plane before the plane went off, in reality, Omar Dresden did die on that plane crash. That man's family is correct. He did die on that plane crash. The person who was taken off that plane, that would be Miss Maya Pope. And she has been held captive by Rowan for 20 years. I know that he probably hired other people to do it, but I'm giving him the orange string. Hands-on behavior. Quinn, Quinn steals the security footage of her killing the security guard. And she gives it to Mouse Boy. Puck figures out that it was Quinn who deleted the footage and killed the security guard and then gave the information to Jake. So he breaks into her house and tortures her. 
Yay, friendship over a cliff. He threatens her, he tries to threaten her into killing Rowan for him, but she does not go through with it because he licked her face. I wouldn't do anything you said either. Oh, Josie, she's still around. Her sister like faked a robbery in their election. This is like election stuff again. She framed president candidate elect, uh, the, the guy who shot his wife's lover that, that one time. She, her sister frames him for stealing their campaign materials. Just convenient, right? Because that is a great excuse for Josie to drop out of the race, which means that Olivia can then go and run Fitz's campaign without having to like sacrifice her morals or anything like that. Fitz eventually does find out that Rowan is Olivia's father. And so his response to that is of course to have her kidnapped. The secret service kidnap her and bring her to this like house in Vermont that he had secretly built with what I'm sure are taxpayer dollars that they were gonna like live in when he was done being president. And it's very cute and sad and a big old bummer because like he killed her mom. But you know, it's fine because he didn't actually kill her mom, right? She's fine. She escapes from prison and she goes to Olivia and Olivia and the team get her in like a safe house. Technically speaking, they are forging her a bunch of documents, but let's just hold off on giving them any kind of a string for that just yet. Rowan sets a trap in his office so that when Olivia and Fitz send in like team of mercenaries to mercenary his office or whatever, it like explodes and it, it kills all of them. And it's a, it's a big bummer. So Fitz and Olivia inadvertently get a bunch of people killed. And I don't necessarily know how to string this. So we're gonna go with white and red between the three of them. We're gonna say this was a group effort, right? Olivia Pope, Papa Pope, and the president of the United States. That's, it's a, it was a, it was a team effort. Still trying to get back in her good graces, however, Fitz helps get Maya on like a secret government plane to safety, which sounds great. Technically speaking, it's an abuse of power, but he's no stranger to that. And in all honesty, I mean, we don't even realize it's a problem until they find out. She's not Maya Pope. She's not Maya Lewis. She's Marie Wallace and she's a terrorist. Whoops. I am going to have to go ahead and give them that yellow string for, for faking her identity because now they're aiding and abetting a criminal. Whoops. Adnan Saif is also back in the United States, apparently. I don't know why we're supposed to care, but we are. And so Harrison is concerned about that. And Maya kills everyone on the plane that they set up for her. Lands in Mongolia, where it was supposed to take her to safety, somehow makes it all the way back to the United States with just, just a bunch of dead passengers, so. Meanwhile, Cyrus has been trying to blackmail Sally Langston with the photos that he took of her husband and his husband between the sheets, so to speak. However, it like sort of backfires. And by sort of, I mean extremely because Sally Langston sees these pictures and flies into a blind rage. <laughs> because while these are like air quote Republicans, She's like a real Republican <laughs> and she, no, 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 no. She cannot have the world knowing that her husband is a homosexual. They'll think that the gays are invading the right. So this enrages Sally Langston to the point where she quite literally stabs her husband in the back, inside of her office, in the White House. Rest in peace, Mr. Langston. Ugh. His body count is climbing. Sally might be a murderer, but she's not an idiot. So she does the, the best thing that she knows to do, which is to call Cyrus Bean. Because when you have a body, you call Cyrus Bean. Cyrus Bean hires both Quinn and Charlie, because they are now like a freelancing hitman duo, to go 
and clean up the body and clean up the crime scene. Quinn, by the way, at one point had to cut out a tracking device that Huck had put in her tooth, which I feel deserves a whole post-it for evil dentistry. So that's what they're up to. Meanwhile, Fitz detains Rowan and we find out that it was Maya who had said that there was a bomb in the first place. So the story now of Remington is that Maya, the terrorist, told her husband, the B613 operator, that there was a bomb on a plane. So he organized to have the plane shot down by the future president of the United States. But she was on the plane and he couldn't kill the mother of his child. So he took her off the plane and then had the future president of the United States shoot down the plane. Problem is, there was no bomb. Uh, there was no bomb. There was no threat of a bomb. Maya Lewis just wanted Rowan to make some random person blow up a plane because she's a terrorist. Like all of that was just for funsies. Murder for fun? Question mark. I guess is a good post-it note to give her because I don't think there are enough strings in the world for that. So because of all this, Fitz fires Rowan as command, despite the fact that you can't take command. Curious. He fires him as command of this organization that he didn't really know existed until recently. Anyway, Jake becomes command. And I'm giving him air quotes because I don't think anything Jake does is serious. Anyway, so Jake becomes head of... B613. He becomes command. Now Olivia and Fitz are back together and they are like making out in the Oval Office. She's running his campaign. Things are chill for like two and a half whole minutes until this reporter, this reporter's name is Vanessa Chandler. Vanessa Chandler, who will be important later, that's why she gets a whole picture, she gets a text from someone named Publius. In Shonda's defense is like a name from ancient Greece or Rome or something like that. You would think I'd know, but I don't. I find it very funny to say aloud. So she gets this text from this Publius person about why it is that the autopsy report for Daniel Douglas has not been released because he, like he died. Like they, they can cover up the body, but like she no longer has a husband. She is a presidential candidate whose husband is, they can't let the autopsy report get out because it will show that he was stabbed in the back and beaten by his very tiny wife. So she is like looking into that, okay? Which then prompts, unfortunately, OPA to start looking into that. Around this time, David Rosen, the law himself, receives a audio tape from an anonymous NSA employee who got a hold of the phone call that Sally made to Cyrus. So everybody, everybody's now kind of poking their nose around, around what's happening here. And Cyrus hears about this and is like, James, will you help me and like not go digging around this and not make any comments about it? And James James very much likes his new job as White House press secretary that he got in exchange for not leaving his husband. So he says no. And he's like, I'm gonna do my job. And he also starts looking into all of this. <laughs> Meanwhile, Harrison is still stressing about this Adnan Saif who we still know nothing about. Cyrus finds out that Olivia and OPA are looking into the Douglas murder. So he hires Quinn and Charlie again. And this time to kidnap the child of the coroner, I think. They kidnap the child of the coroner who did the autopsy report for Daniel Sullivan, the one that these people are all looking into. And they do this moments before Huck and Abby show up to blackmail the coroner. But because Quinn and Charlie got there first and kidnapped her child, she tells them, okay, it wasn't a heart attack. It was an intoxicated fall. He was drunk and they just didn't want that getting out. And so Huck and Abby are like, mm, understandable and not juicy. So they move on and it's just a, a beautiful mess, a beautiful mess. 
Okay, so, oh, I'm just realizing it's Salif not Saif. It's an S-A-L. I'm so sorry. My bad. Adnan shows up. We find out not only were they very much trying to make you think that Adnan was going to be a dude because the way that they reveal her is like very much meant to be like, oh, <gasps> she shows up. They bone and we still don't know what their beef is. I've seen this show so many times and I do not understand what was going on with them before this moment. No idea. She does blackmail him though. So there we go. Oh, also James bugged Cyrus's office because James is Publius. He is the lead dude from the news or whatever, which, oh, she, turns out I did do the research. Publius, by the way, is a reference to Publius Valerius, Publius Valerius Poplicola, a Roman aristocrat who helped overthrow the monarchy in the early 6th century. He was also an advocate for plebes, and his name got used by Hamilton and co as a pseudonym when they published the Federalist Papers. That's actually very cool and not subtle. Look at you, Shonda. Look at you. Anyway, he and David Rosen have teamed up to take down Cyrus. And he's doing this because, as Cyrus once pointed out, he is having trouble dealing with the fact that he made a choice not to rat Cyrus out previously. He is having trouble living with the fact that he was capable of choosing the best outcome for himself over his sort of duty to the moral absolute of justice. Right. Cyrus, not having this problem. <laughs> Cyrus is our ethical egoist, uh, does not feel guilty for putting James in this position at all. Cyrus does not care because what is good for Cyrus is good for the world. On that note, OPA, OPA is like not really taking clients anymore because they are trying to help Fitz actually win an election without rigging it, uh, which is a mammoth task because he's a very bad president and he's a man child. So they are trying to get a baby elected. This baby also needs to now pick a new vice president because his previous vice president and now murderer is running against him. So she can't be vice president. So he needs a new vice president for the next term. And he decides that he wants this guy named Andrew Nichols. Andrew Nichols, looks exactly like all of the other white men on this side of the board. He was like Fitz's Navy bro or college friend or something like that. He had a drug problem about 15 years ago, but that's all the dirt that they can find on him, except for the fact that like he is like a straight white man and everyone is like, that's a bad idea. But Fitz is a man child. So he's like, I can only have people that I trust. I only trust a certain number of people. You stole the election from me. So now you have to give me whatever I want. So it's implied that Melly and Andrew may have had an affair back in the day. In flashback, we find out that Andrew Nichols did not actually have a drug problem. He was getting drugs for Melly, who was having a breakdown post her assault by Fitz's father. And he just took the fall for the drugs that she had gotten illegally. Olivia finds out and kills the story. No one is the wiser. We're not giving anybody crimes for that. Hollis Doyle is back causing problems because of course he is. Cyrus hires Charlie to take care of Publius. You can see how this might be a problem. Charlie and Quinn are planning to set up a fake meeting with Publius. Publius? Publius? Whatever. They're setting up a fake meeting and their plan is to just kill him when he gets there. But James, James does not want to be the face of this at all because he knows that Cyrus has eyes on him. James, unbeknownst to anyone else, had sent David to this meeting. Luckily, Abby and Huck figure it out and they kidnap David before he can get to the meeting, thereby saving his life. So do we give them the kidnapping string? No, no, because you know what? David Rosen is the law. The law is he. So I'm not gonna fault them for saving the law, but I, I will give them a post-it note. So meanwhile, another meeting gets set up and that is between James, Vanessa Chandler, David, and the NSA employee. Put a pin in that meeting. Meeting. We find out that Tom of Tom and Hal fame is actually B613. 
but we don't really have time to process that because Sally Langston is about two seconds from going full Raskolnikov and confessing to murder during a live presidential debate. A debate, by the way, in which all of the presidential candidates are murderers. Anyway, pretty much everyone tries to have Sally killed before the election. No one succeeds, so I'm not giving anybody strings, but you name it, they probably tried to have Sally offed before the election. Is Sally Langston crisis averted? Cyrus can go back to dealing with the, the James Publius Vanessa David murder meeting thing. Cyrus, in a rare moment of maturity, sort of says to James, if you have to expose all of my evil doings, fine. Because I love you. Do it. James is like, sick, thank you, I appreciate that. So James goes to this meeting, only they realize when they get there, you know, James and Vanessa and the NSA employee and David, they realize that like, they don't know who called the meeting. Before they can think twice about it, a sopping wet piece of white bread whips out a gun, shoots the NSA employee, Vanessa and James, before you can even blink. It's Jake Ballard. I meant Jake Ballard. And I'm absolutely giving him two red strings. We're not, we're not saving strings for this man. It's very sad. <sighs> he then basically threatens David into keeping quiet, which I'm not even gonna consider blackmail because he's very literally gonna murder him if not. So it's a bit more intense. And then he also assigns both Quinn and Charlie to convince a dying man to take the fall for it so that he can get medical treatment in prison. We love the United States healthcare system. Quinn breaks into OPA to steal some files. She is on, she is on thin ice by the way because Huck finds out, Huck does break into her apartment with the intention to kill her, but instead, like, they just make out. Good for them, you know, I guess. Just say, the direction that Gwyn's character took is so wild. <laughs> Anyway, Olivia vows, not for the first and not for the last time, to take down B613. Meanwhile, Cyrus is absolutely devastated, right? Not okay, that man is not okay. It's so sad, but they've still got an election to win. So Fitz's kids come back from boarding school to like help him do interviews to try and win the election. And <laughs> Jerry literally runs like a leftist, like a democratic anti Fitzgerald Grant the second Twitter account. <laughs> So he gets a little hashtag anti-dad thing because that's hilarious. Quinn and Charlie are busy like torturing a Ukrainian crime dude named Dimitri who works for some other big bad guy named Ivan who's supposedly working with Maya. I don't know, but orange strings for them. Adnan comes back again and now Adnan is relevant because now we find out that she has most recently been working with Maya Pope. They're doing something, the two of them. Olivia is working with her father to try and take down B613. And Cyrus leaks the fact that Sally Langston's daughter had an abortion. Jake is so sad that Olivia dumped him. Olivia sleeps with Jake to steal his phone, which unfortunately, like, I do have to make a crime, but I, I do feel bad. I think you should be allowed to steal from Jake Ballard but you know, who am I? Abby, Abby meanwhile has been getting, you know, busy and involved in things and she secretly recorded a conversation between Governor Rustin and like his imprisoned wife or something like that, where he admits that he killed her lover on purpose. So he's out of the race, which is great for everyone involved. I mean, except for him, but. Oh, I forgot, Adnan Saif uh, sleeps with Harrison and drugs him. That's another thing she did, sorry. Their storyline is so ridiculous and unnecessary. Um, da, 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 da. Harrison hires this woman named Claire to get information on Maya. Maya finds out about this and has her killed, obviously. She probably hired somebody else to do it, but she's getting the string for it because I don't know who she hired. Oh, meanwhile, oh, 
Fitz has the audacity to demand that Nellie break off her affair with Andrew Nichols. Yeah, the man with an abusive power sticker already has actively been in a romantic cheating relationship for years is like, no, I, I can sleep with your friend. You, you can't sleep with my friend. So he's just going to get a gross post it because it's not a crime, but it should be. So the board looks different because I actually spent two and a half hours filming this whole second section last night and then I realized that I did something ridiculous with the camera shutter speed and it's completely unwatchable. So we're doing it again, but I'm not going to go through the board and cut things off and, and put them back on because God knows that I cannot remember what went where when. So just hang tight until the beginning of season four, okay? So. Where were we? What OPA should be looking into is where in God's name Fitzgerald Grant found the audacity to tell Melly to break off her affair with Andrew Nichols. That's what they should be investigating, but they are not investigating that because they are investigating the fact that Miss Maya Pope has a bomb. We don't know where she has a bomb, but we know she has a bomb and she's got a bomb set on the president. That's her goal. Jake is currently head of B613 and Huck hacks into B613, basically shuts it all down because he's like, we are no longer B613ing. And then Jake is like, excuse me, now we lost all of the data that we had on Maya Pope and now we can't find her and her bomb. But it works out. It works out because you know who can help find the bomb? Command. Rowan, who I don't think is command anymore because Jake is command, but Rowan is like, hey, I know exactly who Maya Pope will have make this bomb. And his name is Dominic Bell. And Dominic Bell just so happens to be, according to Rowan, the only man that Olivia's mother ever loved. So there's... They all team up, OPA and Rowan team up to kidnap Dominic Bell. They bring him to OPA's office and Rowan promptly shoots him after a game of Russian roulette. There are some orange strings from OPA to Dominic for that whole kidnapping situation. There is a red string from Rowan to Dominic for that whole murder situation. Huck also has some blue strings uh, to B613 because of the hacking. Meanwhile, Leo Bergen, he is pulling his own shady shit to try and win Sally the election. And as part of this shady shit, Leo Bergen puts on his own college admissions scandal and he bribes a girl that goes to school with Jerry promises to get her into Harvard and Yale and she extorts a couple of other universities out of him in exchange for some of Jerry Grant's DNA. And boy, oh boy, does she provide it. So that's where he got this yellow string to Jerry. That's where his yellow string came from because that is all kinds of messy. But he needs help getting the president's DNA because he can't exactly bribe Olivia Pope with a college admission. So he basically asks Rowan for help getting the president's DNA. And so Rowan, while they are in the OPA office cleaning up Dominic Bell's body, tells Abby to pluck some of his hair and they give it to Leo Bergen as if it is the president's DNA. They do this because they have already preemptively bribed the people at the test results place to say that the DNA is a match, regardless of what DNA goes in there. So why go through all the effort of actually trying to get the president's DNA off of your daughter's sheets when you could just give him this random dead man's hair? No one's checking. So that's where some of these other blue strings come from. And they do this for a couple of reasons. One, it would not be good if it got out that the president's son was not his son. And two, Olivia finds out that the person who originally asked for the DNA test was Melly. So she goes to Melly and she's like, hey, we took care of it, but do you want me to run Jerry's DNA on the down low? Melly is like, yes, because if you remember, I told you that Fitz's father, Melly, and that was around the same time that they were having children. Meanwhile, President Fitzgerald Grant himself is throwing a little temper tantrum because Olivia is like, hey, can you not leave the White House on account of the fact that my mother is trying to kill you with a bomb? And he is like, um, actually, I would really like to try and win this election, the one that you stole from me last time 
time. So if you don't mind, I'm going to be going to a rally. And she's like, what rally could be worth risking your life? And he's like, this rally in Defiance, Ohio. Because of course it's in Defiance. Anyway, they're kind of arguing about that. Huck and Quinn and Charlie are disposing of Dominic's body. That is the other orange string that's going to Dominic's body from them. So Rowan is left alone in the office, which is a great opportunity for Maya Pope to come in and stab the shit out of him. Bummer! Gets stabbed. She gets back to the office and this man is hanging by a thread. He gets rushed to the hospital. She goes to the hospital with him. Jake and David figure out that the bomb, this is, this says bomb question mark, was never intended to be in the high school or at any of Fitz's rallies. It is at a church. It is at a church in DC. That is a church that is having a funeral for a Senator Hightower. Senator Hightower was killed by Maya Pope specifically so that she could blow up the church with hopefully the president and co inside of it. Jake goes right to Cyrus and he's like, dude, evacuate that church. Don't let the president in. There's a bomb in the church. And Cyrus is like, great, awesome. I will definitely do that and then um, does not do that. Cyrus Bean thinks to himself, hmm, the president's not there yet, but like Sally Langston is. Willful like homicide, I guess you would call it. Um, I gave him a yellow string, which I think it's probably, I probably should have given him an orange string for that, but I don't know. Also, there's all these, you know, red strings to the church in Senator Hightower. So, season three finale. It's I am a knight for the people. I wear the white hat. Season three finale is like every other finale absolutely fucking bonkers. Rowan is in surgery. Someone else has tipped the president and them off to the bomb that is in the church, someone who is not Cyrus, and they are evacuating and sweeping this funeral for a bomb. And Fitzgerald Grant is mid-sentence about how stupid they will look if there is no bomb when the bomb goes off. Um, I think I did an orange to the church because I'm not actually sure if anybody died because Sally Langston certainly did not die. Sally Langston and Leo Bergen are on the steps mid stride exiting when the church blows up. And so they're like quickly rushed into a vehicle and Leo's like, wait, hold on, rips her shirt, throws some dust on her face, turns her around and tells her to go be Jesus. And boy, oh boy, does she. Sally Langston goes out there and starts being like, no cameras, we have to help these people. And she is performing nursely duties. She is saving lives on the, the steps of this exploded church. Genius move. Also, if we're talking about, you know, consequentialism as an ethical outlook, Sally Langston only really going to help those people because she thinks it's gonna win her the election. She's doing it for herself, but she is, you know, technically speaking, helping people. How important do we consider intentions when talking about ethics? So Rowan wakes up from surgery and everyone is super bummed about the fact that there's no way Fitzgerald Grant is going to be battlefield nurse Sally Langston in this election. Everyone except for Fitzgerald Grant because Fitzgerald Grant is like, hey, if I'm not president, I can get divorced. And Olivia, queen of timing, chooses that moment to tell her married boyfriend that his abusive evil father raped his wife and that she just ran a paternity test in order to find out if his son is actually his brother. Fitz takes this news pretty well, actually. We'll talk about this more when it becomes super relevant in like seasons four and five and six. But if there's one thing that Shonda Rhimes loves more than a mic drop, it's a soapbox. And probably because they, you know, made a Republican president the main character and main love interest of their show. He starts to become just like a like blueprint for teaching men how to just like be normal and behave decently. So like he takes this actually pretty well, goes to Melly and they basically call for a ceasefire and it puts an end to the fighting between these two. Even though Olivia Pope absolutely had no fucking right to be airing out Melly's laundry like that. And that's the first thing Melly says is she's like, Olivia Pope can't keep her mouth shut, which is true. It was not at all Olivia's place. Don't do this. 
for the record, but it works out in this scenario because it is a television show. Fitz has one last speech to give and the kids are in town and he's gonna give his last speech and then he's gonna lose the election and then he's gonna go and they're gonna make jam in Vermont. So the whole family goes on stage to give this speech finally, you know, le significantly less fighting and they're a happy family finally. They go on stage and Fitz is mid-speech when Jerry Grant starts wheezing and coughing and dies on stage in the middle of a presidential election speech. So they just won the election is Olivia Pope's first thought when she hears that Jerry died. We know that's Olivia's first thought because she tells Cyrus because they're all at the hospital afterwards, conveniently the same hospital Rowan's at. And then at the hospital, they find out that Jerry Grant died of this bacterial meningitis, which I put this here last night, a, a complete fluke like of nature, it, an illness that could not have been prevented or caught. Or so we're told. Rowan actually informs Fitzgerald Grant that the bacterial meningitis that killed Jerry Grant, it is a bioweapon from like Fort Dietrichs or something like that. And Rowan tells him, Maya Pope did that. The bomb was a distraction. She killed your son. Would you like me to bring you her head on a platter? And Fitz is like, actually, yeah, that would be great. I would really love it if you could do that for me. And Rowan's like, consider it done. Now pay attention. Rowan hires Tom because Tom is B613. I don't know if we talked about that yet. Rowan hires Tom to kill Adnan Salif and he frames Maya for it. He does this as a way to convince Harrison to track down Maya Pope for him so that he knows where Maya Pope is. So Harrison does the looking and finds her because Harrison's trying to avenge Adnan for whatever goddamn reason. Once he has her, he tells Fitz that he's got her, that she's dead. And Fitz is like, that's awesome. Thank you, you can be command again. Um, and so Jake is no longer command and Rowan gets to be command again. Only he didn't actually kill Maya Pope. He threw her in the hole. So. Harrison is like pretty quick to put six and seven together and figure out what went down. And he's like, oh, oh my God, you know, of all the people that benefit from the death of Jerry Grant, Rowan kind of taken the cake for biggest prize, right? Maya wouldn't have really gained anything from killing Jerry Grant because she doesn't have any control over the president of the United States, but Rowan being able to avenge Jerry's murder for Fitzgerald Grant and get his job back as command, that's, that's motivation enough. So Harrison puts together that, yeah, Rowan hired Tom to kill Jerry Grant, and then they framed Maya for killing Jerry and Adnan so that Harrison would look for Maya, he could kidnap Maya, fake her death to the president and get his job back. This was all a really long-term employment scam. So Rowan tells Harrison that he did this because he, the president, he took my child, so I took his. Which, like, um, entering into an extramarital affair with your adult daughter and, like, murdering a teenager on national television, not the same. But that doesn't really matter because Rowan is our resident amoralist, right? And it's not really about morality for him. He's not really concerned with it. It's all just like actions and it's just whatever makes him feel best, pretty much. Anyway, uh, Rowan has Tom kill Harrison. Olivia, in light of the fact that as far as she's concerned, her mother just killed her married boyfriend's child that may or not actually have been his brother. That's too much, that's too much for her. So she goes back to her dad and she's like, hey, remember that time you offered to use government funds to get me a new life? Can we do that? And she takes him up on his offer for a new life and her and Ratman escape off into the sunset. And that is the end of season three. Normally at the end of a season, I would give you a recap of everybody who has died so far, but I got to about episode four or something like that last night. So I don't remember which of these deaths are all from earlier. So we have to hold off on the, the body count. But I do have a little note here about, you know, Rowan and the sort of amoralism and, and not really ascribing it all to traditional morality in the sense of certain things are worse than others and certain things are better than others, right? He runs B613 because he thinks that B613 is the necessary evil from everyone else's perspective, but it's not really evil for him. He is doing what needs to be done. He is making the Republic 
function. He is, you know, running the country, really. As far as he is concerned, B613 is operating outside of the moral community because, like, morality and like what is culturally accepted varies from place to place and culture to culture. So like the moral community in this sense is like the United States and B613 operates outside of that moral community because they have to do things all the time that are terrible and awful. They are aware of the moral community, right? They are aware that like murder is wrong and that they have to do these murders in secret. It's kind of a perfect storm. Um, <laughs> That's all that I have to say about that. And Olivia, Olivia's white hat ideology is very much in opposition to this idea of like an amoral thing that functions outside of the moral community because the mo like morality for Olivia Pope is is a thing. Like it is it is an absolute, right? It's not something that the community of people decided we needed, it is a thing that exists naturally and she knows it does because she feels guilt. Rowan does not feel any guilt, like he thinks that morality was kind of made up and therefore you can act outside of it. When she says I wear the white hat, she's striving to behave a certain way, she's striving for a certain level of goodness and morality, more goodness, less badness, more happy, less saddy. That's her goal and the fact that she got everything she wanted, Fitz is president again, which was at one point an outcome that she was willing to rig an election for. Now the price for that positive outcome is a child's life and she really can't can't do any of this anymore. So she decides that she is going to opt out pretty much and she fucks off to an island where she can just be alone well, with Jake but he's not real so she doesn't have to make the choice and decide whether her father is a good or a bad person decide whether B613 is doing necessary evils she doesn't have to decide whether or not she was right to help Fitz win the election she doesn't have to decide any of this because she is fucking off to an island. That, however, is of course a choice and choosing not to decide has its own consequences that we will see in season four. Doesn't a Republican president asking me to serve in his administration sound a little, oh, I don't know, strange to you? Okay, so season four of Scandal is very confusing and it has too many storylines. So I'm preparing you now. Olivia Pope, this sticker says Island Babe. Olivia Pope is living her gorgeous natural hair, island sun-kissed tan, French expensive wine, fresh fruit from a delivery of a boat to her doorstep, which is the beach life. Living it up, he's there, and she's going by the name Julia Baker, which is like a literary reference, I think. Suddenly though, she gets a letter addressed to Olivia Pope, which is sus because no one's supposed to know a where Julia Baker is and b that Julia Baker is Olivia Pope. Those are not supposed to be things that the people of the world know but somebody clearly does. Inside the letter are newspaper clippings and they are newspaper clippings about the death of Harrison. Yeah, if you couldn't tell from the X that I drew on him, Rowan has Harrison killed. Harrison's dead. So Olivia's like, oh, I guess I I will go back to DC just for the funeral. We'll just go back for the funeral and then we'll come back to the island and pretend it never happened because that totally sounds like a realistic thing that could happen. But she comes back and she finds that things are very different. Things have, things have been a changing. She comes back to OPA and OPA is abandoned. It's totally empty except for Quinn. Quinn, it turns out, was the one who tracked her down and found her. Quinn has been working her fucking ass off trying to find Olivia. Huck has gone and is working at like a genius bar. And Abby, Abby has gotten herself a job in the White House. Abby is the new White House press secretary and she is killing it. And she gets a little style revamp and she looks phenomenal. Fitz is president. He is president. He has basically gutted his cabinet. He fired like a zillion people, including the person that tells him who he can and cannot fire, I guess. I mentioned before that the only thing that Shonda loves more than a mic drop is a soapbox. And this season, this is when that really starts to kick into gear. And it starts with Fitzgerald Grant. 
the third. The Republican president of the United States. And he starts pissing off the entirety of the Republican Party because he is doing things like equal pay and gun control and all of the things that would absolutely get him impeached. I'm sure of it. At the same time, he's grieving the loss of his son. So is Melly. Melly is wearing her pajamas and eating fried chicken all the time. It's all very sad. Olivia has been in DC for like 12 whole hours after planning this funeral when suddenly Senator Stephanie Vaughn, who is like a super champion for women senator, Stephanie Vaughn rings her up because Stephanie Vaughn has a body on her floor. Stephanie Vaughn has killed another senator, Benjamin Sterling, by pushing him off of her second story balcony inside of her home because she has a second story balcony inside of her home. Red strings, right? Admitted the like cases really slow down from this point on to the end of the story and it's much more about this but like we said in the last video the cases on scandal are very much like gettier cases which are uh, like epistemological epistemology just means knowledge epistemological thought experiments about like okay if you think that you see a tree and you're like i know that that's a tree and then you get all the way up to it and it's a super super well painted tree it's just a painting of a tree and you're like oh i guess i didn't know that there was a tree because there's not a tree and then you tear down the painting and there is a tree so like you were right, but you were wrong about how you got there. That energy is how a lot of scandal cases function. And this is no different. So Stephanie Vaughn is claiming self-defense. I pushed that man off that balcony because he was assaulting me, but it wasn't actually Stephanie Vaughn who pushed him off that balcony. It was her assistant. And she did push him off the balcony because he was assaulting her. But Stephanie is taking the fall for it because Stephanie has had this sort of gross shady deal with Senator Sterling where she hires assistants that look a certain way in exchange for him agreeing to things like women's safety and equal pay and things like that. So she has become a champion of women at the expense of every one of her assistants. So that's a big reason why she takes the fall for this woman because she does not need these assistants talking to each other and finding out what has been going on. Meanwhile, um, Jake the whole time is whining, whining like a little baby because he wants to go back to the island because he can't compete with Fitz and he knows he can't compete with Fitz and David and Abby are fighting and David's like, they call you red in the White House. And she's like, I have red hair. And he's like, you have a colorist, which rude. Cyrus blackmails Olivia into going to ensure that this anti-gun power couple show up to this State of the Union address that Fitz is having, but they secretly hate each other and would sooner shoot each other than get on a plane together. So she goes off to deal with that. And Cyrus also starts seeing a sex worker. Michael Ambruso, which is a great name, is a sex worker that starts seeing Cyrus because Cyrus, remember Cyrus's husband is dead because Jake killed Cyrus's husband and it's all very sad. So he thinks that it's all very happenstance that they have like met and run into each other, only it's not because Michael Ambruso, we find out as the audience, is secretly working for Miss Elizabeth North. Who is Elizabeth North? Remember when I said that Fitz was pissing off the entire Republican party? She's the entire Republican party. Elizabeth North is played by Ellen's wife, Portia, and she is the head of the Republican National Committee. And she is out here giving a bad name to Elizabeth's everywhere. She's pissed because Fitz has decided to promote David to like attorney general of the United States. So she is like, hey, don't take the job. And he's like, I am not going to listen to you. I am the law, the law is me fuck off. But she doesn't because of course she doesn't. And she starts blabbing her fucking mouth about all of the domestic abuse allegations that Olivia had Harrison make up to try and get David to break up with Abby in season one. And then everyone's like, maybe David Rosen shouldn't be attorney general of the United States. But David Rosen did not come here to fuck around. And David Rosen, he takes the B613 files that Jake gave him to try and crush B613. And he starts using those files to blackmail everybody who votes for him to be attorney general. That's the yellow string here. And it totally fucking works and he gets the job. Now, this doesn't seem very just, right, for the law himself to be doing, but it seems like David's more 
morals at this point have shifted, right? In light of Olivia leaving, the white hat is gone. He starts to get a little bit more of a subjective take on things. Truthfully, he's had a subjective take kind of since he covered up for defiance, but this is the first time where he really fully says like, I can do a lot of good in this position as Attorney General of the United States, and the good that I can do outweighs the fact that I am blackmailing people. <laughs> and hey, Jake gave him the files with clear instructions to get the bad guys. Speaking of Jake, Jake is looking into the murder of Harrison and Adnan, and when he's doing this he finds on some security footage Charlie. So he goes and he kidnaps Charlie. There's an orange string there. And he does this at a motel. He like bashes Charlie's head into a vending machine after Charlie has like bought like candy from it. Um, and then he eats the fucking candy. I feel like if anyone else did that, I would like it. <laughs> But come on, have some respect. Anyway, he wants Charlie to talk and Charlie's like, okay, I'll talk, but you need to get something for me. And that something is Quinn. <laughs> he wants Quinn, he wants to talk to Quinn because Quinn won't talk to him for whatever reason. So Jake lures Quinn under false pretenses to the like storage bunker that he's hiding Charlie in. And he's like, okay, three hours. And Quinn's like, fine. And then he gets in there and Charlie's like, you said all night. And he's like, oh yeah, sorry. And then he locks Quinn in there all night. So he gets an orange string because now it's kidnapping again. So she's missing and Olivia gets a call from her and Abby's law school friend, Catherine Winslow. Catherine Winslow has married a very wealthy man who's off on business. This wealthy man has a teenage daughter and she's missing. And so Catherine calls Olivia because they're friends and she's like, look, she goes missing all the time. She runs away for a couple days. We had a bit of a fight. This is very common for her. I just want to know that she's safe before I go worrying her father who's halfway across the world. Olivia's like, yeah, sure. So Puck does some hacking and he finds that she is at a hotel. They find her at a hotel and Olivia's like, do you want us to bring her to you? And Catherine's like, no, I'm gonna go get her. It's fine. So she does. So she goes off. That seems like it's gonna be the end of that until Huck finds something else on the girl's laptop. And the other thing that's on the teenage girl's laptop is a sex tape of the teenage girl's boyfriend and Catherine Winslow. Gross. That's this orange string that she has here. So suddenly it wasn't just a fight about, you know, where she wants to go to college. It was a fight about the fact that her mother slept with her boyfriend. It's terrible timing though, because by the time they all get to the hotel, Catherine has already arrived and Caitlin is dead. So Caitlin's death, who killed Caitlin becomes the first big question of this season, right? That's the next big quest that our, our youngins are after. This is where I got up to last night. So let's do a body count, <laughs> including Caitlin. We have Caitlin, we have James, we have Vanessa Chandler, that woman named Claire, Mary Nesbitt, Senator Hightower, Adnan, Harrison. There's an ex here. I don't remember who that's for, but there's an ex here. The other Senator, that spy, Dominic, Daniel Douglas, Jerry. So 14, we are at 14. <laughs> And that's not even considering Operation Remington, which was that plane crash that did happen pre-show, but all right. So, oh my God, this is what, <laughs> so one of my favorite Melly storylines, she gets such great storylines. <laughs> Melly becomes like obsessed with this true crime case where there's a video of a woman possibly pushing her husband off of like a cliff in Yosemite or something. And like the internet's going crazy, like analyzing it, trying to figure out if she killed him or not. This gives Melly purpose. This gives Melly something to live for. She puts down the grief of her son and she's like, I've got this. <laughs> Just starts bringing people to the White House to try and help her solve this murder. And it's so funny. Not relevant to anything else that's going on on the board, but Fitz is trying to get an anti-gun bill passed. So David uses more of the B613 files to blackmail more politicians to get them to vote yes, only this time the judge that he threatens that he blackmails commits suicide immediately after. It's all fun and games until the people that you blackmail have feelings, right? Also, side note, I have a quote from this episode that has David saying, just take it in the sights, buy in a ween. Oh, so, so Fitz has a daughter too. Fitz has a daughter and I think her name's Karen. Fitz and Melly's daughter is off at boarding school and she like sneaks out and like skips her secret service detail and goes to a party, gets absolutely fucking wasted and makes a sex tape and then calls Olivia to like help get her out of there. So they get her out and they find out about the tape. 
the boy's parents start trying to exploit the president who whose daughter is the sister of the president's son who the, you know what i mean that's it's fucked up and Olivia at first is like, okay, maybe just pay them off. It'll be easier. Like, just pay them. It's going to be fine. And then they try to up the price and it's kind of sets something off inside of Olivia and she like snaps back into place and she's like, absolutely the fuck not. And she rips these people to shreds, sends them crawling on their way. It's uh, sick. So we're going to give her a post-it about how cool it is. You know, a little badass sticker over there. It does, however, involve some blackmailing and some threatening on their part, so... Meanwhile, in the other storyline, they're all still trying to figure out who killed Jerry Grant, which sounds like a redundant question, right? Because don't we know that it was Maya Pope? And yes, we do. Don't we know that it was actually Rowan who had Tom do it? Don't we know all of this? Yes. No one else knows this. The only other people that knew this are dead. So we have to watch them figure it out, which is like one of the weirdest, like biggest kind of ball drop moments of Scandal. It's one of the only storylines where like we as the audience are privy to all of the answers. Like there's no one in the room that could possibly know more than us. And it's kind of boring, but um, anyway, eventually Fitz does have to tell Melly though, because Melly, remember the stories that this bacterial meningitis was like an accident that it was just like a fluke of genetics there was nothing they could have done but once they start like pro like trying to arrest the person who did this tom he has to tell her that their son was in fact murdered and melly grant has this absolutely bat shit reaction where she is like oh he died for something it means something he's a hero which is an insane reaction, but also very Melly. So Rowan hired Tom to kill Jake because he's cleaning house at B613. He's like, we need to get everybody who is not me and is not loyal to me out of here. Tom is evidently having a difficult time with it because Jake is still alive. At the same time, Cyrus finds out that it was Tom whose time card swipe login security thing is all fucked up on the day that Jerry was killed. So they arrest Tom and they throw him into the interrogation room. It says int room, but you guys can't read this anyway. It's too far away. I don't know why I do it. So it's our new fun location for uh, season four. We have seen it before, but now it really gets to be center stage. So he is in this interrogation room and they are all trying to get him to confess who ordered him to do it. And Tom is like, I was carrying out an order for B613. B613, that thing that at the time of your son's murder, your ex-Navy pal slash romantic rival was in charge of. But Fitz is not like jumping at the chance to believe that it was Jake. So he brings in the big guns, right? He is gonna, he's gonna bring in like a real true interrogator to find out who did this. So he brings in Rowan to get the real answers. And he looks Tom in the eye, demands that he tell him who ordered him to kill the president's son. And like a good little puppy, he blames Jake Ballard. Because they arrest Jake, we're giving him a pink string for framing. It might be purple that we're supposed to be doing for murder framing, but it's too late. I already have the string up. So now Jake is in the like interrogation room cell thing where he belongs. Again, this is all very pointless and annoying because we know that Jake didn't do it and they just, they drag it out for ever. The whole time Rowan is basically giving Fitz like dating advice for his daughter. That is super weird um, and hilarious at the same time. Fitz is really giving Coriolanus Elena snow in this season, which is not a reference I could have made had I made this video two years ago. You're welcome. Anyway, Jake's missing as far as anyone else is concerned. OPA is dealing with the Catherine Winslow situation because Catherine Winslow is in prison for her daughter's murder. So OPA does some hacking and some digging and they get security footage from Jeremy Winslow, who is Caitlin's father, his law firm, the night that Caitlin was murdered. And it shows Caitlin having a altercation in the elevator with Dan Kubiak. Cubie that. 
Who is that? Who is Dan Kubiak? We don't super know, but she is stealing this file and they are getting in this like physical altercation over the manila envelope. So we're giving them an orange string situation. Quinn and Olivia are basically stalking this man. So they're stalking this Kubiak guy to try and figure out what in God's name is going on. And it's a good thing that they do because they immediately see him murder Caitlyn's best friend from school. Which is, you know, red string behavior. So they're like, what on earth is going on? So we find out that Kubiak killed Caitlyn and Caitlyn's friend over a locker key. The key in question, we don't know what the key is for, but we do know where it is. And where it is, is the small intestine of Caitlyn's friend Faith or possibly the large intestine. I did not do anatomy, which means Quinn. Quinn has to break into the coroner's office, dig the key out of Faith's small intestine. Gross and feels worthy of two strings, right? Tampering with a corpse. Speaking of orange strings, Elizabeth North pays Michael Ambruso, who is the sex worker that is in kind of a relationship now with Cyrus, for photographs of him and Cyrus in a compromising position, which is getting an orange string because I said so. He also starts feeding her information on the goings on of the White House and what Cyrus Bean is, is up to. And Cyrus is a little sus of this. So Cyrus specifically leaks a specific piece of like military themed information to him that he knows is incorrect. And he's like, if this gets out, I will know who Michael is giving information to. Final countdown. I know we're not going episode by episode, but we're gonna talk about season four, episode six, An Innocent Man. I'm pointing it out because this is the beginning of the end for Scandal as we know it. There is another turning point. There is another episode in season five that really seals the seals the deal. But this is, this is the beginning of the end. This is where we become Soapbox Central. And it starts with an episode that deals with the death of a fictional former president, Edward Randolph Cooper. Coop, for short. Now, Coop was murdered, or I guess assassinated, by this guy named Leonard Carnahan. Leo, accused assassin, asks Olivia to prove that he wasn't guilty because there is a lot of people that are like, he didn't do it, he was framed, conspiracy JFK. And Olivia takes the case. So they go through all of this work, right? Okay, they are exhuming bodies. They're rerunning ballistics. They're interviewing people. They're doing all of this stuff. They go through all of this effort to get this bullet back from this man's head. Only for that bullet to confirm that yeah, no, he definitely did do it. He just did all of this to like prove that he did it and secure his legacy and prove the conspiracy theorists wrong. And this is the opposite of a Gettier case, right? Olivia got played. She got properly played by a man who was already convicted of the crime. We knew that things were different since Olivia came back from the island, but now we really understand just how different they are. Badass sticker or not, she is off her game because her gut used to be the thing that she trusted. Her gut used to be what decided whether or not they were taking a case. And she took this case based on her gut and her gut was wrong and she got played. Melly's whole storyline here is learning that Bitsy, the dead ex-president's wife, didn't just like pick out China patterns when she was first lady. She ran the goddamn country because he was dyslexic or narcoleptic or something weirdly ableist. They then paint this portrait that he was like a puppet and she was the brains, she was the muscle, she was the badass. And she is constantly putting Melly down and making Melly feel like shit for decorating and picking out China. And the whole thing is, is very pick me. And it does not read as well in 2021 as it probably did in 2014. Why am I telling you all of this? Besides the fact that it is, you know, we are inching our way towards Soapbox Central. Because of this, because Melly is like, I should be running the country, she decides in her interview about China and lace patterns that she's gonna slip some information about world affairs. <laughs> the information that she drops, however, is factually inaccurate, which 
clues Cyrus Bean in to who exactly Michael is giving his information to. Fitz this whole time is trying to get Jake, who is in the interrogation room, to confess to killing his son, but he won't because he didn't. Olivia therefore tells Fitz that if he tries to execute Jake or hand him over to Rowan that they will never get together again and he perks up like a little puppy and he's like what do you mean is there is there a chance that we'll get together again if I if I don't kill your other boyfriend and she's like yeah probably and so they start having sexy time phone calls again some of which by the way Shonda this is network television this is network television Shonda ma'am so Olivia goes to the Supermax prison to visit Tom. She's trying to get Tom to confess who ordered him to kill the president's son, but he is not budging. He is sticking to his story that it was Jake. And she warns him, she's like, you are currently a loose end. If it was my father that ordered you, you should be concerned because my father does not like loose ends. And she is pretty correct because next thing you know, Tom gets shanked in prison. Luckily, he's not dead. So Olivia goes to visit him in the hospital and she's like, what did I say? My father does not like loose ends. So he spills the beans like an arrow to a sandbag, okay? Now, you might be thinking to yourself, that's a little weird. Why didn't you put any strings up yet? Rowan doesn't seem like a man who gets a guy shanked in prison and doesn't kill him, you know what I mean? <laughs> he seems like a guy who finishes the job. And you would be correct because Rowan did not have Tom shanked in prison, Olivia did. Well, Olivia had Quinn pay some guy to do it, but yeah. Olivia has Tom shanked in prison and she tells Fitz, when Fitz asks why would he confess, she tells Fitz that he's a B613 agent and she handled him the way her father would. And Rowan needs a second little tack thing so that we can put this pink string up because technically speaking, Olivia did frame him for murder. Well, frame him for in prison attempted murder. This video is so long. So Jake gets released from prison slash the interrogation room and of course he is being so petty about it. And like okay I get it. I get that you just got locked up by your best friend after your girlfriend's father framed you for murdering his son but come on. Come on he's running around making people call him Captain Ballard swearing vengeance and things like that. It's very dramatic. Oh, I think I forgot to mention earlier that Quinn, Quinn found Huck's family and not his like family that he likes to look at and stalk, like his family, like his actual family. The one that he got tortured into thinking wasn't even real. So now he is stalking them again. He's got a son named Javi. He's stalking his family and he's playing video games online with his son. Gwen also finds the locker that the key that she dug out of Caitlin Winslow's friend's stomach, she finds the locker that that goes to and she goes to the locker and it is full of pictures of Olivia Pope, right? So she goes to Jeremy Winslow, Caitlin's father, and she is like, um, wh what? And he is so thrown by this that he kills himself. And I don't think that he comes back at all. So I'm just going to put this X on Kate Catherine Winslow because I don't have a paper for him. Abby is in the middle of cleaning up a politician's sex scandal when she finds out that her ex-abusive husband, Chip, is running for an open Senate seat and his campaign is being run by none other than Leo Bergen. In order to keep him from winning the Senate seat and, you know, being all up in Abby's business all the time, Olivia takes on Chip's opponent as a client. And that opponent is Miss Susan Ross. We love Susan Ross here. So Olivia Pope walks into Susan's little tiny 10 person, like, school cafeteria campaign rally and she Olivia Pope's it. She gives she gives Susan Ross the Fitzgerald Grant the third treatment minus the election rigging for free just to help Abby out to keep this awful man out of Abby's life. Girl power. We love it. Uh, solidarity. <laughs> Even Olivia Pope can't work miracles and it's a very, very close call. And Leo Bergen is like, what are you doing? What are you doing helping Olivia get this not politically experienced 
weirdo lady elected in favor of this man who is very, very qualified. What are you doing? And she is like, that man that's very qualified uh, broke my jaw. And Leo Bergen, Leo Bergen, to his credit, sabotages his own client's campaign. Basically hands Susan Ross the Senate seat so that Chip is off, you know, his career is ruined. Also, uh, sparks are a flying. Sparks are a flying. They're passing a bottle of bourbon back and forth in the office and they celebrate the fact that they lost. And it's actually very cute, okay? Loki, I do kind of love them together. I think that they're very cute. <laughs> and it's kind of badass because he kind of wants her to kick him in the face. So I didn't tell you this yet. A little while ago, a car bomb went off yeah, in front of the US Embassy in West Angola and it killed 30 people. And it injured Andrew Nichols, I think is his name, <laughs> Andrew Nichols. It injured Andrew Nichols, the vice president. And this is the event that Cyrus used as an opportunity to find out if Michael is the leak in the White House because he fed Michael false information about this car bombing and the US's plan for retaliation. And Michael gave that information to Elizabeth North. And apparently Elizabeth North gave that information to Melly, who then spat it out on national television. Things are gonna get insane. Cyrus bugs Elizabeth North's phone, yellow string, and she hires none other than Olivia Pope to find out who's bugging her phone. This is how Olivia finds out about this whole mess. So she then has Huck stake out Elizabeth North's house. Huck, who remember has been playing video games with his son online. His son tracks him down and finds Huck and Huck takes his technically speaking kidnapped child to the stakeout. On said stakeout, we find out that Elizabeth North is actually sleeping with Dan Kubiak, the guy who killed the teenager who swallowed the key, who swallowed the bat, who swallowed the bug, who, sorry, the girl who swallowed the key to the storage locker that Quinn found all of those pictures of Olivia Pope in. So they're sleeping together. Kubiak attacks Huck for, you know, stalking him and Huck kills Kubiak. All of this in front of his kidnapped child. Back in the storyline that nobody cares about, Jake and Fitz are still trying to find a way to take Rowan down legally. So they basically trick him into having dinner with Olivia, where they surround the dinner with like SWAT teams and stuff, only for Rowan to be seven steps ahead of them, obviously, and have all of the armed men outside killed. He also swipes out the B613 files that Jake gave to David that they were gonna use to legally take down B613. He swipes those out for blanks. Very a la now you see me, right? Which I guess is like an orange string for destroying evidence. So after yet another, you will rue the day, daughter of mine, speech from Rowan. Rowan dips, but the government still like raids the B613 headquarters, which have been completely cleaned up, right? Like there's nothing there. Well, nothing except for Miss Maya Pope who's still in the hole. So Maya Pope gets charged with murder, terrorism, treason, you name it. And Olivia basically tells the boys that she wants her father hunted down and murdered. Speaking of murder, somebody tries to murder Jake again, but because of the law of Rasputin, evidently, they fail. So now Fitz and Jake are both free to continue having pissing contests over Olivia Pope. And Olivia is free to pay attention to this whole Kubiak, Elizabeth, North, West Angola situation. <laughs> and here is what they put together. I told you that this season had too many storylines. I'm doing my very best here. The car bomb that went off in front of the embassy in West Angola killed 30 people and injured several others. Among the several others that were injured, Vice President Andrew Nichols, who avoided any serious injury. Andrew Nichols, Elizabeth North, and Dan Kubiak were all in Jeremy Winslow's law firm the day that his daughter, Caitlin, was killed by Dan Kubiak. Remember, she was killed for stealing a manila envelope, some evidence of some kind. That evidence ended up in a locker. It ended up in a locker that was locked by a key that Quinn dug out of Caitlin's friend's stomach after Dan killed Caitlin. So Quinn goes to investigate that law firm only to find out that Jeremy Winslow handled the assets 
for Waco, W-A-C-O, the West Angola Commercial Organization. <laughs> right, so she puts together, Andrew Nichols organized the car bomb going off so that the President of the United States would have justification for going to war, which would be beneficial for Waco and the Republicans, I guess. However, the president was too busy dealing with this Rowan, Olivia, Jake, my son, my situation that he didn't go to war with West Angola. Now, Andrew Nichols has to go to plan B. What is plan B, you ask? We'll get there. I can't believe this is Andrew Nichols' first thumbtack. Meanwhile, Rowan is like cleaning house out of B613. So he is sending out assassins, very much now you see me style with like playing cards to kill people like Quinn and Huck and Jake. And by people, I mean he's sending Charlie. Obviously he does not succeed in killing Jake because nobody can succeed in killing Jake. Oh, we're gonna put a big fail because he also fails to kill Quinn because he and Quinn get in like a physical altercation that I'm not even gonna give them string sport because I think they kind of like it. I am happy to give Jake a string for giving Olivia a gun though, because there's no way that gun is registered properly. Anyway, less than 48 hours after his you'll never see me again princess speech to Olivia, Rowan sees Olivia. They have a little sinister dinner in which he hands her another gun, also not registered to her. And he tells her, shoot me, shoot me, princess, you won't. And then she does, and he is floored. It's fine though, because there's no bullets in the gun because he's not that dumb. Um, Cyrus, <laughs> so Cyrus like forces Fitz to let him quit for some reason in like the gayest way possible. He like makes him put on a little play. And it's one of the gayest things that Cyrus has ever done. So representation. Oh, the world found out about Michael and Cyrus. So now they have to try and convince Cyrus to marry Michael to justify it. And he's like, I don't want to do that. And Olivia tells him not to be a little bitch baby. <laughs> So he marries Michael, which means he can go back to work where they are all trying desperately to avoid going to war with West Angola. However, Elizabeth North would very much like to go to war with West Angola. So she goes to Melly and tries to threaten Melly. But I don't know if you remember or not, but uh, Melly Grant is not to be fucked with. No one has fucked with Melly and looked back and been like, that was a good idea. I made a good choice. And Melly, Melly knows that Elizabeth North is sleeping with Andrew Nichols because Melly has also been kind of sort of sleeping with Andrew Nichols. So now Melly's got her on a string, which is great. And I think that covers everything, <laughs> which means we can talk about that plan B that I mentioned earlier. Plan B, plan B, team let's go to war with West Angola. They know that the president won't go to war with West Angola for no reason, right? And if a car bomb going off in West Angola and vaguely injuring your vice president is not enough for Fitzgerald Grant to go to war, the very obvious next logical step is to kidnap Olivia Pope and demand that the president go to war with West Angola as ransom. So that's what they do. It's gonna get really complicated. This is the general people who took Olivia Pope picture, okay? You don't need to know their names. Honestly, none of them matter. And that, my friends, is the mid-season finale for season four, which is kind of sick, I will say. It is kind of sick because shit has not happened to Olivia on this scale before. Like, it, we really, it really does, we really are upping it, right? The sheer concept of it is funny as well because it makes it obvious just how many people are aware that Fitzgerald Grant's in love with Olivia Pope because they could have kidnapped Melly and it probably would have been a lot easier. And the whole country would have been like, yes, go to war for your wife. But like, Fitz would never go to war for Melly. <laughs> He'd be like, oh, All right. 10 pages left, buckle up. So Olivia Pope has a neighbor named Lois and she's gonna be important. And the kidnappers kill Lois and they take Olivia across the hall to now dead Lois's apartment. Olivia is not an idiot. So Olivia drops her ring on the floor of her apartment when she is being 
kidnapped. It's uh, We're calling it her Fitz ring because Fitz gave it to her. It had a whole storyline before. Anyway, she drops it on the floor of Lois's apartment, right? And then she gets knocked out and she wakes up in what appears to be like a foreign country, okay? It's it's deserty, right? It's, it's dusty. There's like metal walls. It, it's giving Yemen. It's giving Middle East. She has a cellmate in there named Ian. And Ian is uh, taking a page out of Jake Ballard's book and he's like being a whiny little baby. He's like, no, they're gonna kill us, they're gonna kill us. And she's like, look, you're clearly not functioning. So I'm gonna tell you right now on the down low, if I'm missing, the president of the United States is looking for me. So like, we're fine. Speaking of the president of the United States, we do get a cute little hallucination sequence from Olivia in her dehydration in this Middle Eastern prison where she hallucinates like being rescued, living with Fitz in Vermont and making jam. And it's very cute. Anyway, Olivia breaks out. She is running down this hallway like it is Forrest Gump, right? She is charging at these like rustic, evil looking doors with the promise of this like desert sunset and freedom behind them. And she busts through and she is on a sound stage, which is the most jarring and comedic moment in the entire season because like, what? Like you probably figured it out because I was like, she is in what appears to be, but let me tell you watching it, mind boggling. The cellmate Ian then walks out like Mark Ruffalo in Now You See Me. I think had I just watched Now You See Me when I first wrote this script. That's like the third Now You See Me reference. <laughs> anyway, Ian walks out like Mark Ruffalo in Now You See Me and he is like, now the real work begins. And that's all we get of that. Back in DC, OPA, we get season four, episode 12, which is called Where's the Black Lady? And it's one of the best episodes of the season because we get to see basically everyone try to, try to OPA without Olivia. And this woman, Rose, keeps coming into the office and she's looking for the black lady, which is Olivia. She is fantastic. She's played by Marla Gibbs, who voiced Duchess in the 1997 101 Dalmatians TV show. And she's just got the best comedic timing. So Marla Gibbs, Rose, is looking for her friend Lois. Yes, that one. Lois told her, if anything ever happens to me or you ever need anything, go to the black lady across the hall. But obviously there's nobody in Olivia's apartment to help her. So she goes to OPA and she does not want Quinn and Huck's help, but Quinn and Huck try to help her. They do not succeed, but they do get into Lois's apartment. They get into Lois's apartment and they find the Fitz ring. So they know that Olivia was there because as Huck says, she wears it for him. She never takes it off. Also around this time, Huck goes like a little rogue, a little haywire and he breaks into Elizabeth North's house and threatens her children. He's like, tell me where Olivia is. And she's like, sir, I don't know. Meanwhile, Fitz gets uh, cooped up, quite literally. He gets cooed up by all of the straight white male actors of the time in suits, sitting in the Oval Office, almost like an intervention, but worse, <laughs> forcing him to go to war with West Angola, basically, which like definitely can't be legal. So we're gonna give Andrew Nichols an orange string to Fitz for organizing all of that. Speaking of orange strings, Huck goes back to Elizabeth North's house for some reason. And this time he like basically shreds up her back with like a whip. It's very gross. Also Tom, the security guard who killed Fitz's son, he's asking for a pardon. God knows why. Anyway, so Fitz gathers together all of his like war people in the government, all the people that do the things that he tells them to do. And he's like, hey, I, I just feel like maybe we should go to war with West Angola. I don't know, I'm just feeling it. I'm feeling it today. Don't ask me why I changed my mind. It was an abuse of power. We could probably make an argument for red strings because of all the soldiers that he's sending off to their death because he's going to war for some chick, but we won't go down that road yet. Um, anyway, they found that ring in Lois's apartment. So Huck starts to do some hacking and he finds out about this Ian guy. Meanwhile, Melly steals Andrew Nichols' phone because Elizabeth basically shows her the scars that Huck gave her when Huck broke into her house. And so Melly feels bad now. So she sleeps with Andrew Nichols in order to steal his phone so that they can hopefully find out where Olivia is so that 
uh, Huck stops trying to kill Elizabeth North, and also maybe they don't have to go to war with West Angola, right? And this turns out to be very helpful because they use the phone and they figure out that Olivia is in fact in Pennsylvania. So David Rosen, in order to help save Olivia Pope's life, which he makes very clear that he is doing, he agrees to fake a drug raid, like set the DEA or whatever on a drug raid on the place where they think Olivia is being held, which is an abuse of power. There we go. I'm so sorry, David. They get there and womp womp, Olivia is not there because Olivia has managed to convince her captors that instead of like killing her, they should sell her to the highest bidder. Tensions are arising between two of the people who are part of this plan and one of them just like shoots the other point blank and he takes over as head kidnapper and puts Olivia up on the dark net for auction. So they're going all Mr. Robot or whatever. Abby, meanwhile, has noticed that Olivia is gone and is trying to get answers out of Quinn and Huck, but they won't give her any because she's not a gladiator anymore. Fitz, however, Fitz is a pushover and he tells her everything. Everything being the fact that the United States of America is about to bid on Olivia Pope in an auction. There is also this really hilarious moment in this episode where Fitz is talking to Melly and I think Cyrus and he's like I want in I want in on the auction who has more money than the United States and both Cyrus and Billy just start listing countries that definitely have more money than the United States speaking of more money everybody has more money than Jake Ballard Jake Ballard is poor and only has a measly two million dollars so he can't afford to even buy into the auction which would be a huge bummer Except, remember when Huck shut down B613, like over the typey typey tech way? Remember when he did that? Like B613 had a budget. All of the money that was in like B613's budget and bank accounts had to go somewhere. So he just like put it in his own account and he's just been sitting on like two billion dollars, which like, I salute you for wealth distribution, my man, but like, what bank are you using that has not flagged that? <laughs> Chime? Like, what are you? Either way, it doesn't matter because in order to get in on the auction for Olivia Pope, not only do you have to have like a zillion dollars, but you also have to prove that you are up to no good, right? You have to be like a world class, world renowned terrorist or something. Shame they don't know one of those. So OPA goes, to strike up a deal with Olivia's terrorist mother in which in exchange for a TV from David Rosen, she will hook the Scooby gang up with an MC, a major criminal. Only like a troll under a bridge or an ancient Greek god, Huck has to kill three men in order to be allowed into the club. So he goes full wolf monster, three red strings, Oh, side note, as soon as Jake finishes helping Huck dismember and dispose of these three victims so that he can bring their heads as proof of concept to the MC, he tells Quinn that he's worried about Huck. Quinn's not really concerned though, because Quinn thinks it's kind of hot. Which, for the record, uh, not a good measure of whether people are okay. Fitzgerald Grant III is not having these problems, however, because, remember, rescue my girlfriend from black market traffickers is in fact a valid use of taxpayer dollars. All of this means nothing, however, because in one of my least favorite plot twists of Scandal, after all of this work, the auction shuts down before it even starts because they have already sold Olivia to Iran. During all of this, by the way, Cyrus has been trying to deal with Andrew, who will not resign, nor will he admit to faking his own assassination attempt or starting a coup against the president. And instead, he decides to blackmail Melly because that's worked out so well for everybody else. Because Melly wants to be president, by the way. I don't know if we talked about that. She wants to be president, so she, the world can't find out about her affair. But again, Melly Grant is not to be trifled with. So she goes to Elizabeth North and she's like, we need this guy taken care of. And Elizabeth North who is in way over her head, admittedly, and the only experience she has with people taking care of shit is when Huck attacked her in her house. So she goes to Huck and she's like, can you take care of this? And Huck is like, no, get out. So Olivia gets sold to the Russians, which is 
super bad because Fitzgerald Grant III cannot keep his mouth shut, which means that Olivia is not only like in danger as a civilian, but she is also a danger as an asset of military intelligence. She knows too much, basically. So if the CIA, Navy, Marine people are not able to rescue her, then they are going to have to take her out and neutralize the threat. So this has Huck uh, reconsidering what he said to Elizabeth North about not being that guy. And he's like, maybe I, I will, maybe I'll just torture Andrew Nichols a little bit and then he'll tell me how to get Olivia back. And the torture part goes really well. The him telling them how to get Olivia back, uh, not so much. So, you know, everybody is failing miserably at trying to save Olivia Pope's life. Everybody except for Miss Abigail Whelan, who is getting a little crown because Abby Whelan makes a phone call. She makes a phone call. And while Cyrus and all the military intelligence people are watching Olivia be sold to the Russians and they are minutes away from having to shoot her down, they zoom in a little bit and they find out the man who is accepting Olivia Pope as his, you know, property that he just paid for is Steven. <laughs> This is the most excited anybody who watched Scandal has ever been to see Steven. Steven was from season one. He was in just a few episodes of season one and they tried to make us really care when he left, but we didn't know enough about him to care about the fact that he left. But now, now we're stoked to see him. Yay, Steven. Also, Olivia gets to shoot her attackers in the leg and like beat the shit out of them for a little while, but I'm not giving her a string for that because she earned it. Now, Olivia goes back to her apartment and guess who shows up? Oh, if only I could make this a crime. Fitz shows up at Olivia's apartment and Olivia yells at him basically because he went to war for her. He took his country to war. That's insane. That's insane. That is insane behavior. Like you don't do that. You don't take your country to war for your girlfriend. So she kicks him out and that's, you know, they're donezo for a little while. Sorry, I had to change the camera battery because I am a professional now and I have multiple camera batteries that I can change out. Cinematography. Jokes aside, the next episode is, is the lawn chair and this is the police violence episode. I remember when this came out. I am, I don't, I didn't research this, but I think that this was inspired by the murder of Mike Brown in Ferguson because Mike Brown was a man who was murdered by the police and then they like left his, left his body on the ground for an appalling amount of time. And so this story follows a 17 year old black teenager who is murdered by the police and basically his father comes out with a lawn chair, puts the lawn chair over his bo son's body and refuses to get up uh, until there's like a proper investigation. He just sits there with a shotgun and he will not move until they uh, properly investigate what happened to his son because he doesn't think that there's any way that his son was guilty. And um, he wasn't. This episode is really interesting for a lot of reasons. It it's one of the first times that we really get to see Olivia confront the fact that she is a black woman. You know, there have been comments, you know, about her race in regards to like her being his mistress and things like that. Papa Pope talks about it a lot, but this is the first time that like she is confronted with people in a community that she's not part of, right? Like she is a private school trust fund. She got a Republican president elected, you know what I mean? So she's not like super welcome when she shows up to this scene and she shows up to the scene because the police asked her there. And I am not one to comment on that, but if you find those kind of conversations interesting, this might be the episode of Scandal to watch. Also, I always recommend FD Signifier's video on police violence and also Big Joel's video on the Minnesota Police Department, the police department that was responsible for the man who murdered George Floyd in 2020. Those are both great videos if you want to talk about this 
whole thing in more seriousness because we're not doing a serious analysis of Scandal. But I, I wanted to take a minute to talk about this episode because it's a soapbox episode. This season airs in 2014, I think. It's the waning of Obama's America. Prior to season four and this episode, the political implications of like Republican President Fitzgerald Grant III were very much background. It was kind of a joke. Like it was always a joke that Abby and David were like super liberal and Abby was, you know, super liberal and always had to work for these Republicans because those are the people who hired Olivia. It was like kind of a joke. And then I think culturally when we get to like 2014, 2015, 2016 and so on, the real world implications of those beliefs are so much that they can't be ignored in this show. So they have to figure out ways to backtrack and ways around this whole thing. And it really has to become like Law and Order SVU, where they have to portray the world as we think it should be. Which is why like the police officer at the end of this episode goes on like an insane racist rant, like just like horrifically racist rant and everybody in the station is like appalled and he gets arrested and Fitz brings the dad in and like pardons him for you know threatening everybody with a shotgun and like they start working on a bill for like police violence and they do all of these these things and it's it's very much like SVU like how the world should be and it's just very weird it's very weird because that is not how the world is and it's also not how this world is like this is a world of Republican murderers running for president like, it's not a bad episode by any means. It's not like ungenuine or unnecessary. It's, I think it's decent. I'm not one to judge, but it, it does have this weird, uncanny valley vibe to it. From this point forward, we see Scandal stop being a show about people who happen to work in this fictional US political world to a fictional story in the political world that we live in. Also the color grading gets so yellow and so vibrant. Okay, so Fitz's previous vice president started a war, right? So he needs a new one, uh, someone who is good and cool, but not too good and not too cool because Melly still wants to run for president. And everybody, we're all on team Melly for this, right? We are all on board the, the get Melly to the White House train. Not gonna lie, it would be a Republican woman that ends up the first woman in office. I'm sure of it. I feel like running for president is like the ultimate pick me, but I don't know. So they're looking for a boring, unelectable woman to be Fitz's vice president. Enter Susan Ross. Single mom, pro-vaccination, possibly a Democrat, I think. Senator Susan Ross. Only she needs like an early 2000s makeover montage in order to be vice president material. So they have to call in Leo Bergen. They have to call in Leo Bergen to my fair lady the shit out of Susan Ross and turn her into somebody that won't cry on national television. But Leo Bergen is so mean that he ends up making her quit on the spot. And then his new girlfriend, Abby, fires him, which you would think would be bad news. But in a surprising turn of events, Leo totally digs in and thinks it's the hottest thing that Abby's ever done. So good for them. I would let Abby fire me too. She says in the least objectifying way possible. Anyway, Olivia goes to try and convince Susan not to quit. So things are looking up. Things are looking up. Olivia convinces Susan not to quit and Susan kicks ass on Jimmy Kimmel. She gets to be vice president, but they still are having trouble getting the votes because of that time that Fitz went to war with West Angola. Speaking of that time that Fitz went to war with West Angola, do you remember when Olivia got kidnapped and she, <laughs> the evil kidnappers killed her neighbor and then while she was gone, her neighbor's friend showed up at OPA and was like, where's the black lady? But they couldn't help her because they were too busy funneling government funds into Huck's bank account so they could bid on Olivia in the illegal auction. Remember that? Well, she's back. Rose is back and she is looking for Olivia's former neighbor, Lois, because they were roommates. And yes, that means exactly what you think it means. So she's trying to find her girlfriend and then Olivia has to kind of lie to her about how she died so that they can find her body and have a funeral service for her, which 
certainly includes tampering with a corpse, right? Meanwhile, Huck's wife, who had a kid with him before he got kidnapped and turned into a killing machine for B613. She finally believes him, right? Basically the last couple seasons, she's been like, you are crazy, leave me alone. Um, but she believes him now because of all the B613 files. Problem with her believing him is that she is like, we should go to the cops. <laughs> We should go to the law. I am the law. The law is me. We should go to the government, tell people what's happening. And she works her way all the way up to the point where like they are gonna have like a hearing about it and Huck has to testify and he has to lie. That's the plan. The plan is that he's gonna go and he's gonna lie on the, the stand and about it and say that it was just something he made up for PTSD. But he gets on the stand and he is like, you know what, fuck it. And he tells the truth. So we are back on team takedown B613. That is the mission once again. <laughs> okay, Lena Dunham is in this show. <laughs> She's literally in one episode, but I don't know. I felt compelled to print her picture out. So. <laughs> so Lena Dunham's in this show and Lena Dunham's character is about to release a tell-all book about all of the Hollywood men that she has slept with, which does include most of this board. And so she's just like telling all their kinks, right? She's just airing it all out. This is a problem for Abby because Abby has slept with two of the men in this book, which are David Rosen and Leo Bergen. And if the world finds out what Leo's into, then they will know what she does. And then it's a whole, it's a big problem. So they are trying to convince her not to release this book. So Olivia goes in with like a standard slut shame and Lena Dunham comes back with extortion. Change in tactics. They now need to basically figure out who every single man in the book is so that they can bring them all together and then they can all pay $175,000 each to make up for the money that she would have made in her book deal in order for her to go away. So David doesn't want to pay the $175,000 either because, you know, he's attorney general and doesn't want to participate in blackmail and extortion or because he doesn't have $175,000 to spare. We will never know. Cyrus, however, Cyrus offers to just pay $3 million himself out of pocket just to get the names of everybody in the book to be shady. Anyway, so some guy threatens Lena Dunham at knife point probably because he's in the book. I say threatens because he doesn't succeed because Huck and Quinn show up and convince him not to stab her, right? Only for Huck to turn around and immediately murder her. <laughs> He's basically like, she would have talked eventually. They always do. This is the only way to protect David and OPA and uh, Olivia and Abby and everybody that he loves, so. <laughs> Also, if David's career gets ruined, then his immunity for testifying for B613 in Operation Takedown B613 will fall through. So murdering one chick to increase your chances of getting immunity for all of the other people that you have murdered. Logic, I guess? Quinn lies to Olivia to in order to convince her not to go after the person who killed Sue because she doesn't want Olivia to know that it was Huck that killed Sue because she doesn't want Olivia to like put Huck in timeout. Abby and Leo have kinky sex. Huck gets his immunity. Fitz and Jake gossip about Olivia and uh, Olivia gets laid by a stranger and um, yeah, in the end, it's a very much a not important storyline. You can probably cut this. Cyrus blackmails Sally Langston into keeping quiet about his marriage of lies to Michael Ambroso. And Cyrus, we find out in flashback, Cyrus used to have a wife. Cyrus was married to a woman and she divorced him because he's gay. Homophobic. Back in the present, Olivia is still having like nightmares and flashbacks, but not like fun scandal Shonda flashbacks. Flashbacks that we aren't really privy to. We don't want them. Bad, bad flashbacks. Bad backs. Sally is trying to stop the fake gay wedding because she's homophobic and a buzzkill. They basically threaten to expose her own marriage of lies to a gay man if she comes after and exposes Cyrus for his marriage of lies to a gay man. Oh, Olivia puts her Fitz ring back on, so I guess they're back together. So OPA takes a case, a case that we are calling the math murders. Basically, there is a congressman. The congressman has a father. The father is currently on death row for the murder of the congressman's daughter's math teacher. The guy on death row killed his granddaughter's math teacher because they were having an affair. The granddaughter then also killed herself because they were so in love 
or so she thought. So the congressman brings this case to OPA and he's like, can you prove that my father didn't do this? Or can you get him off of death row so he doesn't die? That would be great. The congressman, however, does not want Olivia looking into this case. He's like, back up, stop asking questions. I killed the guy, game over. Stop asking questions is not a command that Olivia Pope has ever understood, uh, ever. So they keep digging and they find out it wasn't the congressman's father that killed the daughter's math teacher. It was the congressman and his father took the fall for him and said that he did it and has spent like 20 years in prison. And he's been basically threatening to kill himself if his son ever tries to confess to the crime. That's just yet another murderous politician is why I tell you this story. To be fair, this guy deserved it, but still. Anyway, there is drama between Jake and David because Operation Takedown B613 again is proving more difficult than anticipated again. So Huck and Charlie decide that the only logical solution to their drama is to kill Jake Ballard because of the law of Rasputin. They fail again. Mutant mouse. He's telling you he's like a mutant mouse. There is like a big, huge fight scene going on and people are definitely dying. I don't remember who or how many, but people definitely die. And we're like 90 five percent sure that it's Jake, right? That is karate chopping all of these people because it's all B613 agents that are ending up dead in this fight. Only we find out later when we watch Jake creep up on the law and his assistant that it was not Jake who killed those people at all. It was David's assistant. Do we know anything about her? Do we care about her? No, but you know, for the record, this is also the first storyline that I had to look up the episode plot twice while speaking because I can't even follow my own writing. I can follow this red string though, straight from Jake to David's assistant because he, her real quick. Jake, who also, while we're on the topic, is squatting in Dead Lois's apartment, which is bad enough on its own, and then you remember that he's just doing it because it, she's across from Olivia and he wants to stalk Olivia. Technically speaking, he says that he bought it, but I feel like that just makes it worse. So I'm gonna say that he's squatting and give him a yellow string for it. Cause Jake could always use more strings. It's the age old proverb. Anyway, either way it doesn't, it's useless because Rowan shows up at his front door anyway. So Rowan and Olivia have another, I made you, you ruined me, I love you, I hate you conversation. And he threatens her trying to get David to drop the B613 case. And also he drugged the guy that Olivia had been seeing. Now at this point in the show, you might be feeling like you are sort of missing out on the smooth, fast talking, suave, super clever, eye candy man in the office, right? It's a big Harrison sized hole that they've left, but have no fear. Have no fear because Marcus Walker is here. Marcus Walker is a character that we met for the first time in the lawn chair episode. He should be over there, but I can't reach over there anymore. We met him in the lawn chair episode. He's a local activist and he is also Harrison 2.0. <laughs> Like I, he, he functions the same way. He's like clever and like, he's, you know, flirty and hot. And like, they do a crossover with how to get away with murder later. And like Michaela, like uh, fawns over him. He's Harrison 2.0. I have notes in here about how I should probably cut that because he's not a bad character. It's just like, if they were going to pull like a two and a half men Fresh Prince of Bel-Air recast moment, they probably could have gone with this guy and it would have been fine. <laughs> Anyway, he is sleeping with the mayor's wife, which is how he ends up hiding in the closet during her murder. So she gets murdered and he, cause he's not supposed to be there cause he's, she's the mayor's wife. So Marcus calls Olivia Pope. Cause when you've got a body, you call Olivia Pope. Very much the way that they cleaned up the crime scene for Quinn in season one. Quinn and Huck clean up that crime scene because Marcus is like running for political office and it will ruin his political career, career if he is like a murder suspect and testifying about his affair in a murder trial. Okay. No. 
It's all for naught, though, because of course it is, because it's scandal, and every time they put a lot of work into something, it becomes pointless very quickly. And he ends up, like, testifying in her trial and killing his political career anyway. Unemployment, here he comes, right? It's not like him suddenly being out of a job is gonna be really convenient for the writing of this show, is it? Also, this whole time, there's this like 1200 page bill called Brandon's Bill, which is from the lawn chair episode. Remember I told you that there's like a bill for like police violence. It's called Brandon's Bill. And Susan, Susan Ross is holding up the vote because she is the only person who wants to actually read it. <laughs> And everyone's like, you don't have to read it. You just have to like approve it or not approve it. That's not, we don't, come on, get chop chop. And she basically tells Fitz to fuck off because she intends to actually, you know, do her job. Unlike some people in this office. Oh, speaking of telling people to fuck off, Olivia tells her dad to fuck off regarding the whole stopping the B613 takedown thing. Oh, the guy that Olivia has been sleeping with. Remember that other guy that Olivia had been sleeping with that Rowan drugged? Yeah, he uh, stabs Jake in the OPA office. But of course, because Jake is like a cockroach, he lives. By the way, there was like a whole, there was like a whole he was B613 storyline thing that we, it doesn't matter. There's that. Because Jake is now injured, they take him to a like super sketchy retired KGB doctor. We're just gonna put Dr. KGB on a post-it because in exchange for his services on the down low saving Jake, Olivia has to Olivia Pope his problem, which is convince the handler for another retired KGB agent not to force a stone cold killer turned stone cold bacon grandmother back into work. So in exchange for the Russian handler not forcing that random grandmother lady back into evil spy work, Olivia offers the KGB command. <laughs> She offers them the head of B613. The head of B613, who is currently in the process of murdering the second man that he has paid to be her boyfriend as punishment for not murdering the first man that he paid to be her boyfriend. Makes sense? Obviously. Of course it does. Only uh, womp, womp, womp. He doesn't actually die. No, 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 no. Olivia finds him too, and also brings him to Sketchy KGB Doctor, which is how other guy overhears the plans for the KGB Doctor to kill Rowan, which is really good news for him because he can tip Rowan off to this and Rowan has them killed. Womp, womp. Which unfortunately leaves Jake without a doctor. But they take Jake to a real hospital and Rowan tells the other guy to initiate Foxtail. <laughs> Meanwhile, Sally, Sally's been a bitch and she's making fun of Melly for running for Senate because Melly's running for Senate. I don't know if I told you that, which to be fair, doesn't sound like it should be legal, right? Like you should, do that doesn't sound like you should be, right? That doesn't make sense. And um, it is because apparently the men who made all the rules never even once considered the possibility that a sitting first lady would like to run for office. So there's no one to tell her that she can't. Right now, the only one telling her that she can't is Sally, who won't stop running her mouth on her television show because, oh yeah, Sally, since Sally lost the election, she now runs like a, like a Ben Shapiro right-wing TV show or whatever. And she is talking smack about Melly, which sounds like a job for Cyrus, right? Sounds like a job for Cyrus, who goes onto her show and mansplains sexism to her. <laughs> tears her to absolute shreds and falls just short of receiving a medal for his services. He does a good job. So Olivia goes on a date with the other guy. They have a sexy little date night where she whips out a gun. She whips out one of those many guns that's not registered to her and she demands that he tell her what the fuck foxtail is, about, is all about. Cut to the next episode. Other guy is tied up across the hall in Dead Lady slash Jake's apartment where Huck and Quinn have just been torturing the shit out of him. And then Jake and him have this weird like, you two bonding moment over the fact that they are both the man that Rowan hired to sleep with his daughter. A very normal job description. I know, but some guy 
comes in and knocks Huck out and rescues him. And I'm just going to give the string from him to him because I don't have a thing for this other guy. Anyway, um, Olivia, meanwhile, is handling a military rape case on behalf of Susan because Susan is a boss and Fitz is a coward. So Olivia does her thing. They do, in fact, eventually get the guy because they always do. And Melly uses this as an opportunity to criticize her husband's presidency and like ability to do his job, which is so good for her campaign, makes a whole group of women in Virginia chant her name like it is a religious experience. She becomes the Taylor Swift of Republican women in Virginia. So she's stoked and she is off on her way to a campaign meeting. Because she has this donor, Damascus, who has been mysteriously offering to pay her zillions of dollars to fund her campaign. And she goes off to meet with him and what, Rowan? Oh, that's, that's right on his face. That's mean. Damascus Bainbridge is the name that he's using. And like, if I had a dollar for every time an episode of Scandal ended with a surprise reveal of this man's face, I could run for office. Okay, here we go. Season four finale. Can't take command. Command takes you. You didn't think we'd ever get here. <laughs> Neither did I. This is a good time for me to remind you that Melly, Melly Grant, knows absolutely nothing about B613. Zilch. Doesn't know about Rowan, doesn't know about Remington, doesn't know about the Olivia Jake of it all. As far as she is concerned, this is Damascus Bainbridge and he is paying her lots of money for her campaign, which means that he can blackmail Melly. And she has no idea what she's getting into when he basically demands a list of names from her is all he wants. And so she goes and she, you know, has like her assistant or whatever, pick out the names and give them to him. And she's like only mildly concerned about this, this blackmailing thing, but she doesn't tell anyone because she doesn't know that she should. Meanwhile, uh, Fitz and Olivia are off having a little heavy breathing phone call, as they do, which is good because they're gonna need all the oxygen they can get because a whole busload of people was just killed. Which busload of people, you ask? Well, I will tell you. That was 12 X's I just drew on that bus sticker because the people that are killed on the bus are the 12 jurors in the B613 trial that Jake and Huck have been putting together. That's, whew, that does not sound great. And that definitely sounds like uh, some shit that Rowan ordered to be done. Those 12 jurors, by the way, just so happen to be 12 names on the list that Rowan asked Melly to get. That was what he wanted her to get. He wanted her to get him the list of the jurors on the B613 trial so that he could get them all on a bus and kill them all. So Melly, she is freaking the fuck out. She's like, fuck, I just got a busload of people killed. What do I do, Cyrus? And Cyrus, Cyrus is just like, do not tell Fitz. I will help you, I will fix it. So he goes directly to Rowan and he's like, can we come to an agreement? And Rowan is like, actually, I did you a favor. I am actually protecting your secrets, like Operation Remington and everything else that B613 knows that you definitely did. So as a matter of fact, you, you owe me, really. You owe me for this. And I'm gonna collect right now. I'm gonna collect now. You are gonna go to the CIA and get them to stop looking into all of this B613 madness because my daughter is down there right now telling them everything. So figure it out. And Cyrus Bean commits to the bit. Cyrus delivers and Cyrus basically has both Olivia and Jake like arrested for revealing secrets. That feels like some yellow string behavior. And while they're like rotting away wherever they are, he threatens to murder Abby in order to convince David and Olivia and Jake to sign affidavits saying that they were lying about all of the B613 shit. And I'm feeling string happy, so I'm just gonna give them all blue strings for that. I had to change the camera battery, but this is it. Everybody that was team, let's take down B613, signs affidavits saying that they were lying, which is that blue string that I put here. Rowan, Rowan somehow gets Maya out of jail. I don't know why, and I don't know how, but 
she's free now. She's free now. She's out and about. And he calls up Olivia Pope and he's like, I'm a ghost. No more B613. No more Rowan. I'm just Eli Pope. Normal, regular guy. Which is great because normal regular guys can get arrested for embezzlement. Fitzgerald Grant III does one thing, one singular thing in his presidency, and that is that he gets Rowan arrested as Eli Pope for embezzlement. You can't take command, but you can certainly take Eli Pope. Mic drop of a line. Mic drop. Shonda Rhimes has done it again. He also tells Cyrus and Melly that he knew about, that they knew about the juror situation. And he tells Melly to get the fuck out of his house, which by the way, is the White House. He tells her to get out of his house. Then he goes off to Olivia's apartment and Olivia does not answer. She does not answer, which would be a huge bummer, except for the fact that she is waiting for him in the residence of the White House on the little balcony so that they can end season four with a bang. And that, my friends, is your crime by crime recap of seasons three and four of Scandal. Oh my god. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this. There will be sources in the description. Also link to my Patreon if you would like to support me there. The award for best comment from my last video goes to Asher Jeff for commenting, ugh, I can't believe we're still talking about John Locke in 2024. And um, yeah, I guess I'll see you in 2026. Bye. Oh my god, I forgot to do the body count. Okay. <laughs> All right, seasons three and four together, we have. Technically the math murders were pre-show. The President Coop, the mayor's wife, Dominic Bell, David's assistant, Senator Ben, whoever this one was, Adnan Saif, Lois, Harrison, the guy that was involved in Olivia's kidnapping, Senator Hightower, Mary Nesbitt, Claire, that spy, Vanessa Chandler, James, Jeremy Winslow, Caitlin Winslow, Dan Kubiak, Caitlin Winslow's friend Faith, Daniel Douglas, Jerry, oh, the, the Russian KGB dude, Lena Dunham, this says judge. Am I missing anybody else? All 12 of those jurors and the bus driver, 13, 36, not including the people at the embassy in West Angola, whoever was at the church that Maya Pope blew up, and Operation Remington. But that was pre-series, so whatever. 33 plus the unknown. And the unknown there. Okay, now we're done.